So committee, what did you hear what I said throughout? Or, oh, geez. <laughs> okay. Uh, right. Okay. I will, I'll go back to that. So, <laughs> I can only see you, Glenn. We, uh, sorry, we weren't aware uh, of that. Um, clearly, I guess a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, Councillor Hayes is not with us as yet, so I would need to uh, note that for the record. And I would go back to, um, and it would call in this meeting to order at 902 at that back at that point in time. Uh, all members were present, save Councillor Hayes. We do have quorum. Uh, the CEO, clerk, and members of the senior management team and staff are present. Uh, public input on the agenda was uh, invited to TML public comment at muskokalakes.ca. We received uh, comments from Muskoka Steel Dock Company re regarding township docks. And the public notice is today's meeting is being live streamed and uh, recorded on the Township Muskoka website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open public meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. We do have a, a supplementary agenda today, and it involves uh, Tony Molnar uh, regarding a co some comments on the Waterhouse application for the license agreement on Moon River. Uh, again, we have the Moon River Property Owners Association on that same topic. We have uh, Moon River Property Owners Association on the winter plowing of Camp Jackson Road. Uh, Corey Sherman on the Clear Lake Association uh, bylaw, noise bylaw information. Rob Michalaki and Lisa Tremaine to attend regarding their license application. And then uh, Jim Bornhold to speak to that same application. So I would ask a committee at this point in time if there are any uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Okay, good. Seeing none, thank you, committee. Having read through that, we'll uh, begin item uh, 4A, which is delegations. We would invite uh, Mike Silver and Ian McLennan of the Clear Lake Association regarding a noise uh, bylaw. I guess some input. Uh, Yeah, and so we'll invite Corey Sherman to uh, to draft in uh, there right after, and I'll invite you in, sir, right after uh, Mike Silver and Ian McLennan um, speak to us. So, Mike, are you there? Mike Silver, there you go. We see your name. Welcome, sir. Mike, Michael, we can't hear you, sir. Oh, there you are. Okay, so Mike, you're in twice on the meeting. If you can hear me now, you're just connecting to audio. Okay, he's corrected that. You can start with Corey Sherman. Yeah, okay, so listen, uh, while Michael's getting connected there, hopefully he can hear us, but we'll let uh, Corey Sherman, sir, if you would like to go uh, first, uh, in the interest of time, you can go right ahead. Well, you have two minutes, sir. Go ahead. Oh, we can't hear you. You're mm -hmm. muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor Hardy and members of council. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. My name is Corey Sherman. I'm a resident of Clear Lake. My parents have owned a cottage just a few minutes away on Lake Muskoka for close to 50 years. When I decided to purchase my own property, we made a decision as a family to look at the smaller lakes, the lakes that have been known in these parts historically for their peace and tranquility. Last year, I purchased our cottage on Melody Hill Road toward the end of Clear Lake that is occupied by the Beer Spa property. Up until that point, I understand from fellow residents and neighbors, there have been no real issues from the beer spot. Things have changed this summer. At my first general meeting of the Clear Lake Residents Association, about a dozen folks spoke up with complaints about the beer spot. The noise, the obnoxious behavior, loud amplified music, and the dangerous activities by their guests at the unsupervised lakefront. 
by a show of hands at that meeting, what appeared to be a unanimous vote confirmed the fact that the noise from the beer spa was disturbing the peace, peaceful and quiet enjoyment of their properties. Many others have provided me with emails, video and audio recordings of loud music and amplified, sorry, loud noise and amplified music on the lake. And all have expressed serious issues with the activities being regularly carried on at the beer spa. One gentleman talked about the constant noise day and fact, day and night, and the fact that if his grandparents who bought their cottage 80 years ago had to experience what is going on now, they would never have purchased there. Members of council, the beer spa is a commercial business on Clear Lake that is playing loud amplified music day and night and providing an unsupervised group of loud and obnoxious guests a place to yell and swear on our lake. Something really bad is going to happen under your watch, and I urge you to take action immediately to stop it. I beg you to pass this bylaw and to help us designate Clear Lake as a quiet zone in order to protect the generational tranquility of this area. Okay, on good. your Let's... own website, you have a code of conduct under the noise bylaw section. <laughs> Some of the bullets in that code state, and I quote, limit excessive noise at any time of the day. Control amplified sound so that it cannot be heard beyond the limits of your property. Avoid using profanity or swearing as young children may be nearby. When the sun sets, turn down the music and keep voices low. Noise carries across the lake, especially at night and when the wind is light. Neighbors are more sensitive to loud noises at night. Hey, Corey, sorry if I might, that's your, you've got two minutes and we're being generous there. So thank you for that. I'll let uh, Mike Silver to speak. Now, I, I would though be somewhat uh, understanding if Ian McLennan is, is Ian going to be here? Mike? Um, can you hear me? We can now. Yes, we can, sir. So oh, okay. <clears throat> I know he's in Europe. <clears throat> he was going to try to be, but if he isn't, then then something has happened technically. So right. Um I, do you want me to speak now? Uh, please do. Okay. So um, I'm on the board of the Clear Lake Association. Um, this issue was delegated to me. Hey, it's always me. <laughs> uh, I've been before council before, and I, I didn't hear everything Corey said, but let me indicate why we're here. We are here to talk about the beer spawn torrents and the current limitation of the noise bylaw. Uh, right now, the bylaw is such that there really aren't any meaningful restrictions between 7 a.m. and 11 p.m. There's nothing that respects others' quiet enjoyment in a residential community. There's nothing that really focuses on respecting ecology or the environment or historic uses or what's just plain neighborly consideration. Um, and that's not fair. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that this Saturday, we were on our dock. And I'll tell you what's not fair. It's not fair that we couldn't be there. We were not able to use the dock. I had guests. We couldn't stargaze. We couldn't talk. We couldn't hear ourselves think. We couldn't hear loons. We couldn't even be outside. And the loud music was streaming across the lake. And that interferes with the quiet enjoyment of everyone else. And, you know, Clear Lake, there are many people, we live here all year round or for much of the year, it's homes, it's cottages. In, in some cases, families like my own have been coming for over 80 years. And, you know, people have doled out significant money to their life savings to buy a place uh, or they're retiring up here. There's all kinds of different lifestyles. But one thing we could all agree on is that everyone's entitled to quiet enjoyment and the peace and beauty, family and friends, the solace and a sense of belonging that comes from one's home. That is all ignored and tossed out because right now we have a new business that may very well have an inappropriate business model for this community. And it's being imposed on a historically peaceful lake. So we had an AGM uh, a couple of weeks ago, and the question was asked, how many people have been disturbed by noise? There were probably about 80 people in attendance. Almost all of them, like 98%, raised their hands. They've all 
experienced it and they're from all over the lake. Um, <clears throat> I think that with the advent of live concerts, amplified music, and some of the potentially rowdy behavior that I think Corey has talked about, the current business at the spa is just overwhelming us, uh, all the rest of us on the lake community. We've had a peaceful lake for 115 years. Camp Pinecrest respects that. And now it's as if we're starting to live in a CNE grandstand. I want to stress, Greg Knight is a good guy. Greg Knight is my friend. I have worked well with Greg Knight in the past, and I think he does care about the lake. And the association has tried to work with him. He's an upstanding member of the community in many respects. The problem is that he's trying to run a business in a commercially zoned area, and he has every right to do so and every right to make money from it. But in the past, that business was a mild-mannered cottage court renting some cabins to families. There were no issues then. But now a business model's been introduced with weekly concerts and, and, and amplified music and outdoor stages and all the rest. And that's not compatible. That's not compatible where you're catering to partying, transient stays, amplified music, and open-air concerts. That's not what uh, Clear Lake had been about in the last hundred years. So we are asking council to strengthen its very weak and outdated noise bylaw in order for the council to be able to adopt the designation of quiet zones like it's been done on Myers Lake uh, and the Lake of Bays Township. And that would be a community request, which we are requesting. Um, these amendments, and I think Ian McLennan has provided those drafts to you, uh, would enable the designation of quiet zones. And the principal effect of that would be really to prohibit amplified music. That's the boogeyman. It's amplified music and noise at any time. It's just not right that that be imposed on everyone else. By the way, none of this has to hurt Greg's business. Um, he has, in fact, I think quite uh, uh, willingly tried to uh, quiet things down and work with the association. But he also concedes that he won't always be the owner and he's not always there. And for example, <clears throat> he, can't, he can't exert perfect control even when he is there. As I said, I called last week for the volume to be lowered and I was told by an employee, Jason, that he was only an employee and had no power to lower the volume and he wouldn't lower the volume. And that was the number Greg had given us all the call. Okay, Michael, Michael, so Michael, you're at five and a half minutes. Uh, so I get you to quickly wrap up, please, if you would. Sure. So we just need to twig the uh, regulatory regime here, eliminate a wild west of noise and uh, pay some respect to uh, community people who pay the highest taxes and do much to support the local environment. Please do listen to us and uh, do the right thing by adopting these amendments. Thanks very much. Good, thank you very much. Okay, um, before I ask committee, I'll, I'll seek out, I do believe, if I think I'm being told that um, our, our enforcement, the bylaw enforcement head, if you will, uh, Rob Kennedy, is, is he available? Rob, are you here on, oh, there he is, excellent. Good stuff, thank you for, uh, for being here. Now, I would refer to a meeting that uh, we had at, Clear Lake with with uh, Mr. Knight, yourself, uh, Ruth Nishikawa, counselor, and uh, and myself. Could you speak to that and perhaps maybe in more general terms, what we're hearing from the community here today? Uh, through the chair, uh, yeah, that happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. We met at uh, the brewery, just myself, Councillor Zavitz, and Councillor Nishikawa. Um, and in general terms, it was more just on what Greg has done to mitigate noise. Um, both at the brewery property as well as the beer spa property. Um, there was a comment made in regards to possibly making the beer spa property a quiet zone, regardless if a bylaw ever changes. Uh, but the, the bottom line is at this point, uh, the bylaw states that the only prohibition for noise on, <clears throat> excuse me, amplified music and uh, yelling and shouting is from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Anything in between 7 a.m. to 11 p.m. of one day. Um, there, there's nothing in our bylaw that would prevent people from doing that. And I made it quite clear that we have received not 
I will, I will state we have not received a single complaint about um, the brewery or the beer spa up until about two days ago uh, for noise, which in turn was no issue because it was uh, within the permitted time. Um, but overall in the township, we have received a number of daytime noise complaints that unfortunately there, there really is nothing that bylaw enforcement can do in this matter. Um, and I, other than that, I don't think there's anything of note you know, in regards to that meeting. Um, but uh, Greg, Greg is, as uh, Mr. Silver has pointed out, Greg is is fully willing to work with uh, with everybody to come to a good resolution that uh, will be amicable for amicable for people. Thanks. Good, thank you. And I, I think as we hear from the community, the community is looking to our existing noise bylaw to uh, to bolster that, to to improve that, to give it uh, more teeth, if you will, so that there's some sort of um, you know, energy around it in, in, in places like this. Not very, you know, strangely enough, the, the, the agenda doesn't refer to specifically uh, Clear Lake Brewery. And usually uh, when this occurs, the person who owns a brewery might be here uh, to provide a secondary opinion. And as I understand it, there's there's been a lot of talk and perhaps it's just talk of, of working together with the community. And yet I'm hearing the communities here and they're not, uh, they're simply not pleased. So um, with that, uh, I guess one of the thoughts would, would be to talk to the committee here and let, let's hear what you have to say. The mayor has his hand up, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Zavitz. Uh, to Mr. Kennedy, um, Rob, I'm wondering whether or not there's uh, almost I'll call it a hybrid version, uh, number one, that, I mean, as opposed to a full quiet zone that they can't have any amplified music. Is there a decibel level? Is there anything? Is my first question. A second question that I think you can answer at the same time. When we monitor uh, noise after 11 p.m. or before 7 a.m., are we no, we, is it noted on the individual's property or are we saying there was noise emanating to my property? Um, and how are we enforcing that bylaw? Meaning if there's no noise, I can't hear it at my property, then does the noise exist? I guess is the <laughs> question. But where I'm going with this is, is there an opportunity for us to look at part of the decibel coalition with loud stereos and boats? Meaning when I hear a loud stereo, and it's projecting noise onto my personal property, is there an opportunity within whatever type of new hybrid bylaw we could create to affect change here that might be applicable to the marine industry? Uh, through the chair, the decibel portion is a little bit difficult for us to enforce because in order for us to put decibel levels into our bylaw, you then need to have all enforcement staff be like legally trained in being able to read decibel levels we'd have to purchase decibel readers um, and go through that whole process uh, and that would take quite a long time I think I don't know I don't know of any current training opportunities for uh, decibel reading and uh, of that sorts I know the Municipal Law Enforcement Association does hold an environmental noise course uh, once a year uh, where they will train you on on having to read decibels, um, but if we input decibels into the bylaw, it would be it would be a little bit more difficult in the in the short run. But I think in the long run, it might be beneficial. Um, that being said, uh, for the second question, the noise is taken from the point of reception, so it's not that we go to the specific property that would be making noise. Mind you, we're not here from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Um, so everything that we deal with in noise bylaw for that type of noise right now is done after the fact. And we would require that either a person uh, provide us a video of what the noise was from their house, which they usually do. Um, or we require a statement given um, in regards to what the noise uh, sounded like, what their, what their issue with it was, you know, did they lose sleep? Um, were they not able to sleep? Were they not able to be outside? Um, any anything of the sort, uh, but it's always taken from the point of reception. It's not taken from the actual property where it's emanating from. Okay, thank you. Councilor Nishikawa and then uh, uh, Councilor Bridgman. Ruth, go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, through you, I'm just, um, I wanna mention uh, that the, the Myers Lake bylaw 
for a quiet zone is actually Georgian Bay. Um, I'm pretty sure that's where I looked it up. But also, uh, I don't believe, um, just for, for you, Mike Silver, I don't believe that all of council has seen that document. Um, so I'll, I'll make sure that staff does that, you know, because I know we, we did distribute it. Uh, I think I distributed it to Rob, but um, we'll, we'll make sure that the rest of council gets that information. Um, it is very interesting because uh, we've heard complaints from not Clear Lake. Um, and in fact, quite a ways down uh, closer to Camp Crossroads, if you can believe it or not, off of East Bay Road. Um, that's a quite a ways away, but it is real because there's a lot of water in between. Um, and, uh, you know, I certainly, as um, a, a nearby neighbor, um, I have uh, um, listened, I don't have the same effect that uh, being right on the lake, but I, but I hear it, I, I understand, I'm concerned. And, but I will also say that I can hear the key as well. And I can hear the key at um, one o'clock in the morning. So we, we've got a, a broad thing to deal with, but I think the, the, the quick and easier one is to start with Clear Lake. Um, I'm concerned that we are gonna try and bite off, like now all of a sudden we were talking about boats. Well, that really distracts the conversation in my opinion, because th there's no way that we can police that. We, we just can't, I mean, we, we don't have that ability. And, and it's interesting, the decibel conversation, we've had that in my term, like time on council, thank you for bringing it up because I think this was the year that it hadn't been mentioned, but it's been mentioned over the years that it's just not possible. So um, anyhow, I, I hope that we can just deal with this suggestion uh, I, I think that they've gone to the uh, um, the effort to uh, come up with something that is is uh, what other municipalities have done, uh, and that we can move this forward in a timely manner. I don't want to though get this lake burdened down because we can't address every issue throughout the township. So I would like to address this particular. Uh, Lake Associations. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And before I call on Councillor Bridgman, I would ask Rob Kennedy a question. Rob, within your body of work and enforcement, uh, I know that you and I have had many discussions about uh, a number of, of, of projects, if you will. Is, uh, is the noise bylaw on your hit list? Is that something that's imminent or close? Or is that something we would uh, make special, uh, special reference to here? Uh, through the chair, um, as, as far as that goes, the pr presentation we did last year with the list of bylaws that were uh, needing to be updated, the noise bylaw was on that list, but it was a little bit farther down than what we're dealing with right now. Um, as, as you all are aware, uh, we now have the short-term rental bylaw and the AMPS bylaw that is supposed to be done. Um, so that has kind of jumped that whole list, um, and that's that's a pretty substantial project. Um, we obviously have the site alteration and tree conservation bylaws that are coming up this afternoon. Um, we introduced the dark sky bylaw last, uh, last month. So um, I believe before the noise bylaw is supposed to be heard, it's uh, the property standards bylaw has to come forward before that based on the list. Um, but if uh, committee and council wants to flip that list around, um, you're more than welcome to do so, and we can start working on some stuff earlier than than anticipated. Uh, but we do have a number of projects that we're working on right now that um, may hinder our ability to do this one as well. Excellent. Thank you. I assume that. Okay, uh, Councillor Bridgman, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Zavitz. And I, I don't have any answers, but I do have a perspective having been on uh, just down the shore from Cleveland's house and Peyton house for over 55 years. And every Saturday night, Cleveland's house had a dance that went on until 11 or midnight. That was okay because it was once a week. Um, and uh, it ended, I think, by midnight. Peyton house, uh, we didn't even hear, but nothing was outside. So I'm sitting here listening to all of this for the first time saying, if you have an outside band and you're going to have amplification, do we need a special permit for that? As in Shake the Lake, which disturbed a lot of neighbors. Um, if it isn't amplified, are we okay with it outside? 
And is it just on a Saturday night? Because for the summer on a Saturday night in a resort area, I, I'm, I, I would have to ask the association, but it seems to me that might be manageable. So I just throw those out from my perspective of being close to noise uh, pollution uh, in this area. Okay, good, thank you. Good comments. Uh, okay, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Savage. Uh, our uh, noise bylaw for uh, Port Carling, maybe Mr. Kennedy could uh, and that brief us on that because we do have a, a noise bylaw there and I believe all music has to be inside at a certain time and that, but uh, uh, if you could just uh, bring us up to a date on that, they may help us. Thank you. Through the chair. Um, this this was asked last week and I have no recollection or any record of a Port Carling specific noise bylaw. We have a section in the current bylaw in regards to the exemptions for tourist accommodations. And in the tourist accommodations, all music and everything needs to be moved inside as of 11 p.m. But they are allowed to continue that music as long as the windows and doors are closed up until 1.30 in the morning. And that is the only thing that I know of. I don't know of any, I have never seen a Port Carling specific bylaw in regards to noise. Okay. There's a few people here that have. <laughs> Councilor Nishikawa and then the mayor. Thank you. Uh, just really quickly, and I'm, I'm, Mr. Pink uh, informed me of this as well, because I, Alan, had the same um, thing. But in fact, that was a, in relationship to them um, getting their liquor license. So it wasn't actually a change in our bylaws. It was actually a request from the community when their liquor license came up for renewal. So that's how we were able to put that in place, but it wasn't a change in our particular noise bylaw, just that that happens um, because of their liquor license. Okay, thank you. Mayor? Yeah, just to further that, Councillor Nishikawa is correct. It's uh, regarding the Turtle Jacks property in particular. At one point it was called the Blue Box um, and they would break some evening bylaws, lots and lots of noise. So it's a site specific they are not allowed to have outdoor amplified music on their deck at any hour of the day. So um, I, that's my recollection of the bylaw of the uh, specific liquor license in that particular case. Good, thank you. Okay, committee seeing no other hands up. I guess I would, again, uh, not picking on Rob Kennedy, but Rob, I'm wondering, again, within the body of your work, if we as a committee asked you to come back next month, uh, and I, I will say this, I would preface that, um, you know, here we are in the middle of August, uh, the, the season is, as much as I hate to say it, perhaps two thirds over. Um, so we, not that we have time, and I hope the cottagers don't think that I'm trying to just buy some time, but we do, you know, there will be uh, many winter months where this noise bylaw can be uh, in a much more fulsome manner reviewed to an eye to what the mayor has said, even site specific uh, requirements that, that may be deemed necessary um, given locations. Um, I would ask you, Rob, I mean, if we ask you today for a, a fulsome staff report for, you know, September, uh, where you take into account what the Clear Lake people have provided as, as input and, and what else we've known and what else you've gathered. Is that realistic of us to ask you to, to come to us in uh, September with a report uh, on noise from your perspective on this topic? Through, through the chair, um, it would be difficult. Um, one being that I actually am not available for the September meetings. Um, I will be away on course. Um, and with the workload that staff has right now, just in regards to complaints and, and whatnot, um, we, we are quite, quite busy. So I don't know if it's realistic to come back in September uh, for something like this um, with, with a whole review and a whole report um, in regards to possible changes for the noise bylaw. Um, I, can, I can do my best, but I can't give any type of promises. But if committee wishes to direct that it comes back in September, um, I will have to put other things on hold in regards to getting that done and, and we'll be able to come back. Thank you. If we were to extend that to October, uh, and again, not to negotiate with your time, but I, I guess the thought being is that in addition to, as I asked this question of the committee in a moment, uh, as well uh, to um, 
somehow be engaged and involved with Ruth Nishikawa, myself, Danelda, the three counselors in Ward A, perhaps helping the uh, association work with Greg Knight. Even in this, there's a, I think there's a couple of pieces to this puzzle. First of all, right now, the immediacy of it, and then longer, longer term, what, what does next year hold and beyond? And, and that is, I think, uh, we're all adults here. We're looking at this thing as a it's a problem. It needs to be solved. And I think we need the information in front of us before we can, you know, essentially solve it in more than a piecemeal sort of approach. So uh, given that, I'll let uh, Councillor Roberts and then the mayor have one last thought, then I'll ask a question of you. Okay. Is there just, I, I just thought of that, your last point, uh, uh, Chair. Do we have a resolution in front of us or is just would it just be a nodding of the heads? Essentially, it would be a nodding of the heads. This is a okay. for information only, believe it or not, scenario. Um, but I, we would like to, you know, give this thing some life if, if we can uh, yeah. Yeah. For, for, all, for all parties. So, okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. So then through you, Chair, I'm, I'm supportive of um, curtailing noise during the daytime. Um, and that's just not at commercial properties, but with the new technology, I had my, my family up on the long weekend and my son had this off his cell phone, this speaker that you could blast across the lake music. And so anyone can purchase these. So we really got to look at this. Um, I just caution uh, committee that uh, really something has to be done. We got to start it, but we've got two things. We got to as we know, an extremely overworked, um, um, or busy, I don't say over, very busy staff that are doing their best. And uh, I, I could hear from um, Mr. Kennedy that, you know, uh, your choice, which one do you want to take off the uh, the place? So we got to look at that. But again, this is very important. So, and and, and final point is that um, we don't, we, we and this uh, previous, uh, this term of council, we've jumped in and made some quick decisions that had uh, repercussions someplace else. So we really got, well, I know, uh, so anyways, yeah, I'm just saying, uh, 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 Chair Zavitz, that we got to make sure we cross the T's and dot the I's on this one. But something does have to be done sooner or later. But uh, So that's what all I have to say on the point. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Harding, and then uh, Councillor Bridgman. Thank you. I think on the same lines as uh, Councillor Roberts' perspective, uh, let's make sure we get this right uh, and don't do a knee jerk. I think the other reality is, uh, and um, respect to the neighbors, this problem theoretically goes away come mid-September anyway. Uh, we're not all sitting out on our dock. We're not all outside. We tend to be inside. Uh, I think people out at a beer spa in snow or cold is probably not going to be as much of a problem. Um, I, I'd love to hear from Mr. Knight what he has to say and what he can do to helpfully mitigate some short-term issues. Um, that we can make sure we get this right. Um, so certainly want to help, uh, but just want to make sure that we do get it right. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Bridgman and then Councillor Kelly, and we'll move on. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Chair Zavitz. Uh, yeah, we, we need to get it right, which I think takes time, but I'm going to ask that you ask this question directly because to me, something gets bumped off the list, the priority list that we have given Mr. Kennedy to do. And I need you to ask that question saying you're prepared to bump something that's in process off the list to put this on by October. And I will not, I, I will not be able to support that. I think this can be done over the winter. So thank you. Okay, good. Uh, Councillor Kelly, thank you for that. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you through you. Uh, I may have missed it, but I, I don't think I heard that there was a meeting uh, among uh, Mr. Knight, the uh, the Cottagers Association, and perhaps a couple of uh, councillors. I, I, I wasn't sure that Mr. Knight was involved, but uh, this is a relatively new venture for him. I'm sure he wants it to succeed. I'm sure he wants it to be uh, successful, you know, without trampling on the rights of others, peaceable occupation of their own property. And I'm wondering if the quickest short-term fix isn't to sit down and try and find something that 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 in the in the interim is a compromise that part, perhaps in the fullness of time becomes part of a, of a new uh, noise bylaw. I, I suspect, and I know obviously Mr. Knight from the Economic Development Committee um, that uh, he will that that might be a good good first step as far as I'm concerned. Exactly. Uh, thank you for that. Before I call on Councilor Nishikawa, I'm going to let David David go ahead. David Pink. 
Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning, Committee. I just uh, wanted to reiterate uh, Mr. Kennedy's comments, um, uh, just with respect to the number of bylaw updates that are occurring. And if uh, Committee really wishes to pursue the noise bylaw, uh, there needs to be some clear direction as to which other, uh, whether it's short-term rental, uh, the AMPS uh, monetary uh, penalty system, uh, dark sky bylaw, or uh, tree and site bylaw, which continues uh, which uh, is going to be bumped. Uh, but what I would suggest, and I think I think some of the discussion uh, is uh, focusing in on that now, obviously we've heard from uh, property owners on Clear Lake. Obviously Mr. Knight and other businesses uh, could be impacted uh, by this. And I would suggest um, that we really need to receive input and engage uh, with those business owners. And I would suggest uh, before staff could return with any report, uh, they really need to uh, discuss those parameters uh, with Mr. Knight and other business owners and that certainly will um, take some time. We could endeavor to try to do that um, over the coming months but I would um, somewhat echo uh, the mayor's comments that at this uh, late time in the year uh, it's likely uh, uh, that any bylaw change uh, really won't have much of an impact until uh, next season's activities. But uh, again, I just wanted to reiterate uh, Mr. Kennedy's comments. I think he did an excellent job answering uh, the question, but I wanted the committee to be aware that uh, uh, I certainly um, uh, relate to that. And uh, we need to, uh, again, receive some direction as to which bylaw would uh, would take a backseat if, if noise bylaw is being bumped up. Thank you. Good, good. Thank you, David. And so seeing no other hands, um, as I understand it, and as I comprehend this, uh, I don't believe there's an appetite here amongst this committee to bump anything. Uh, everything you're talking at, about is a number one priority. So we seem to have a lot of those. This is another one. And certainly um, I share the committee's uh, thoughts on uh, eyes on this and, and ears on this, certainly. And that um, this will become part of the body of work uh, within the winter months uh, as it relates to that. Secondarily, though, and perhaps I suppose primarily, would be that I'm certainly willing to to get with Mike Silver and uh, Corey Sherman and Councillor Nishikawa, and uh, if Rob Kennedy, David, if you're available, you know, and, and set up some sort of a structure where I hate to call it a committee, but uh, a group that that could talk about the issues and at least table the issues and have that create that better understanding. That would be a great first step, and I can tell you that Mr. Knight would be the first one in the room. So I know that we all want to make this a better situation and a winning situation. And so uh, thank you for your comments. Committee, I don't believe I need, oh, uh, sorry, uh, Rob, Rob Kennedy, go ahead. Uh, sorry, through the chair, just to clarify, I just looked up the, um, the list that we had last year. Um, and in reading it, we have uh, number one and two are the site alteration and tree conservation bylaws. Um, number, and this has already really changed because we have uh, short-term rentals and amps that have been added into this, um, but noise is number eight on the bio, or on the list here. So we have dark sky, property standards, business licensing, um, two new bylaws that were possibly going to be introduced, littering and clean yards, and then our public docks and ramps bylaws. So num uh, noise is number eight at that point. And then if you add short-term rentals and amps on top of that, we're down to number 11. So it, it is a little bit far down the list. So if committee wants to move it up that list, um, then I'm, I'm happy to do so um, and put it before, you know, business licensing or property standards. Um, but uh, it's, it's up to you guys. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much for that. And I, I'm not sure that there's any kind of an appetite to, to move your list around. Uh, I might ask uh, Corey or, or Mike uh, show a, a thumbs up or something. Um, would you be amenable to that first meeting, uh, getting together as a group and talking about the issues, understanding the issues as, as, as uh, we come into that, those winter months period, you know, there's an election, there's a new council, there's going to be a new body of work. Uh, this would certainly be, you'd have our commitment that this will certainly be looked at as a result of getting it on the dance floor today. Is that something, Corey, that you could, yeah, thumbs up, way to go. Thank you. Thanks for working with us and working with the, the community. Um, Councilor Nishikawa, I'll give you a last word and then we're gonna move on. Well, I, I, I guess it, my comment about not trying to just, uh, like trying to just throw Clear Lake's issues into all of the other issues of noise in the township means that this is not gonna get taken care of. And in fact, I've seen it time and time again 
we will put this button even way further back in the burner because some, somehow it'll become about Manette or it'll become about downtown Port Carling or some other area. But in fact, to put this whole thing on hold so we can deal with the whole township is not what, what the, the request was. And that's why they drafted a bylaw. I think um, it, I, 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 and I personally don't need any more meetings to discuss what's going on. We already know what's going on. Um, this is not new. Uh, there, you know, the, there's lots of history here. It hasn't just not over the last two weeks. So I'm really disappointed if we're gonna only, if this community group has this, it will decide today that we're just gonna lump it all together and wait till that, you know, 11 items down on the list kind of thing. Cause that's not what was brought forward today. Um, and I hope that once the other information is uh, distributed from Mr. Silver, um, that others can think about it a little bit differently. This is an important issue in Ward A. Well, they don't question. bring that many issues in, in, in that are, are um, affecting Ward A, but this one needs to be addressed and it doesn't need to be addressed in order to make sure stuff happens the way they want it in other parts of the township. The effect is here now. Well, Councilor Dishka, I, I, you know, you know, we understand. Uh, you use the word "this is not new." And quite, uh, quite honestly, it is new. What, what is new is the, the notion of the magnitude of, of the uh, of the exposure now of that of that place. Um, it seems to me that uh, you know, Mr. Knight uh, and Mr. Silver and Corey and you and I and others. I see no reason why we can't quell this concern. You know, initially. Meanwhile, going on, you know, Ballot's got its own problem with the key. And I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but you know, we seem to have Ward A issues about noise. You know, people in the bowl, in the bay, et cetera, hear the key every night. You hear it in at, at Camp Crossroads, for God's sake. So, you know, this is a bigger issue, and I and I do believe it, it is somewhat new as it relates to Torrance. But I, you know, you and I can, can agree to disagree on that committee. I'm looking at you here and now. If you're satisfied with the way I'd summarized it and that we would do a sort of a two phase approach to this where some local folks would get together and discuss this in the short term, meanwhile, getting to a longer term solution uh, with our bylaw people on noise. I'm seeing a general shaking of heads here, folks. Good, thank you. Okay, good. So thank you for all that great input and Mr. Silver and Corey Sherman, thank you for your time. We appreciate it and um, it's for the public on the public record. Thank you. So it's 10 to 10, approximately 10 to 10. And we have item uh, 4B, which is Dave Hewitt and Gail Curran, Peninsula Alliance Club to attend regarding a request for a refund. Are they uh, are they here? Can we let them in, please? I don't think they're here. They may just call. Okay, is there is anyone here? Dave, Dave or Gail, is is that, are you on an iPad? We're going to bring the iPad 74 in and hope it's one of you. Oh, there's someone. We can't, we, we can't hear you. Uh, Dave, could you, is it Dave? Could you, could you identify yourself? We can't hear you. Can you get your audio going? Okay. Is that hey, can you hear me now? We can. Is that Dave? Yep. Oh, good, Dave. There you go. You have the floor. Okay. So I, I'm Dave Hewitt. I'm the uh, president of the Peninsula Alliance Club, and and the reason I want to uh, to address the committee today is uh, essentially um, we were invoiced um, for the hall for our annual yard sale. Um, which we paid. Um, uh, however, in, in the past, we have uh, we have received a fee a fee waiver for that. And to be to be fair, uh, the last one was 2019 because of COVID. In 2020 and 2021, there was no yard sale, and uh, we did neglect to uh, 
seek a fee waiver before the actual event. So I guess that's on us. Um, a couple of things I want to mention. Um, obviously, the Lions Club is a, is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we, uh, we contribute to the, um, we pay our own administration fees. The members pay their own administration fees. Uh, so far this year to date, we've, uh, we've donated two bursaries, $500 each to local students and $500 to the Port Carling, uh, Carling Club for their youth program. Um, so we feel that, um, you know, and this year what happened was uh, we had increased costs. Again, everything's going up with COVID and, and decreased revenue. Um, so we're going to find it a little bit difficult to fund our, our programs. Um, we do have some reserves, but uh, we're just we're just seeking uh, a refund of the uh, seven eleven ninety, as was done in twenty nineteen um, in February at the February nineteen meeting via agenda item agenda item six B. So that's what we're looking for, and I'd be pleased to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. And now this is for the rental of the Peninsula Road. Uh, the community right? center up in Manette. Yeah, up in Manette. And now, yeah. sidebar, were you, you were in uh, Bala, am I right, a week ago uh, at the Bala Community Center for a, a fundraiser? Was that your group that was there? No, that would have been Port Carling, I guess. Was it? There's a club in Port Carling as well. I, I wasn't there. I don't know. I don't okay. remember anybody being there. Not that that really matters, but I guess I would uh, call on Director Becking here in terms of, given the historical um, significance of this that, that was last occurred in 2019, where you were actually given a, a waiver. Um, I wonder, uh, Director Becking, if you could speak to that in terms of, I guess, protocol before us committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and good morning, members of the committee. Uh, the club, uh, according to current policy, the club gets a 50% uh, reduction in the uh, rental fee. Um, and that was, was given um, for this event. Um, if the club wishes further uh, relief from the rental fees, they are required to apply to council for, for a waiving of the fees. That has been the past practice and, and um, would have to be a, a committee decision uh, at this time. Okay, uh, I guess a secondarily question to you for the committee's uh, benefit. Uh, are we, uh, have we done this for others, other service groups in the, in the past recently, more recently? During COVID, at COVID, um, it, it is a a common practice, uh, but uh, again, as I, I alluded to in my earlier comment, uh, the policy as it presently exists is that staff are are able to provide a fifty percent relief in the in the fee uh, for for depending on circumstances. Circumstances, uh, the club uh, does uh, satisfy the definition in the policy. Um, any further relief is is uh, at the discretion of of committee and council. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Uh, I believe the event that you were talking about was the William Marion District Lions Club uh, fundraising event. Um, I've said this uh, and that before. We have uh, given this this refund, and that I would support it again. I think we should look at changing our uh, policy. They shouldn't have to come hat in hand every time they're raising money to give to the uh, community, and that they're volunteers. And uh, I I would definitely give it back. And I think we should look at the policy. There should be no 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 charge for the service groups. Thank you. So, okay, so thank you. Before I call on Councillor Jaguar, so again, Director Becking, um, so the, the event in Bala, would we have extended the same courtesy, if you will, of a 50% discount that we did to Peninsula Lions Club or would that we have with the, the event in Bala? Would that have been 50% off? I don't know the specifics of the event in question, but uh, yes, if it was a Lions Club, 
they would meet the definition and, and would be afforded the same uh, uh, discretion. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Okay, Councillor Jagowitz and Councillor uh, Nishikawa. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I would support uh, granting the, the request. Uh, and, and part of the logic is that they haven't been able to hold this for a couple of years due to COVID. And uh, that would just be helping them out as we look at the policy. So I'm in support of this. Thank you. Good, thank you. Councillor Nishikawa? Well, I didn't want people to be confused. This was not an event that was put on by the Lions. The Lions happened to be the, the group that they... Uh, the, the, the groups that were involved, they used the Lions as the food vendor. That was what that was about. It was not the Lions event that took place in Ballon, if we're talking about that. Yeah, I, and I was only asking the question for a consistency point more than anything. Well, and, and in fact, I, I know about some of that rental and um, it would have been waived, um, except that there was liquor involved. So that becomes a little bit different. But in this case, and, and I know myself and, and Terry Ledger, for instance, uh, sat on the committee to rewrite that. I actually don't recall that um, service clubs specifically being um, brought up. It was just, if it's for the community, we wouldn't be charging rent. So I didn't realize that we were charging service char clubs because quite frankly, um, they are the ones that are doing a lot of the heavy lifting in our communities and, and filling the, the voids that um, Good. aren't taken care of. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mayor, and then I'll get thank us. Just, just a quick question, I guess, to uh, Mr. Hewitt, one, and then also to Director Becking. Um, uh, this was a fundraiser event day um, in, in round numbers. Do we raise $500? Do we raise $5,000? Do we raise $50,000? And also then to Director Becking, what is our fees uh, or what is our half price fees that we're charging? Okay, to, to your question, um, our net from that event would be around 5,000. Director okay. Becking. There's, there, there's dribs and drabs coming, but we'll net, we'll net around 5,000, which funds our, our donation. Okay, and Director Becking, was the number $711 I heard? Was that? Uh, that's correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, that's inclusive of HST, I believe. Okay. Okay, Councillor Bridgman, and then I'll look to your the committee for a thought. Go just ahead. A, just a quick question to Mr. Hewitt. My understanding is, Mr. Hewitt, that that's down from what you've raised uh, before with this. So I just wanted the committee to understand that you don't have as much as you used to. That's correct. Last year, or in 2019, I, I believe we netted about 8,000, so. Okay, good. Okay, so I, I don't have an actual resolution here, so I'm gonna to look to committee here, so sort of a nodding of heads, thumbs up. Uh, who would be in favor of uh, uh, actually refunding this uh, $711 for this fine group? Okay, okay so I'm seeing, um, okay, we certainly have a, consensus. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, there you go, Mr. Hewitt. Thank you. I think at this point, procedurally, procedurally, there's no resolution. Right. So I need to ask for... So I would suggest maybe we correct Mr. Becking based on committee's consensus to bring a resolution to council next month. This afternoon? Well, then we need two thirds and we need to do all of that. Okay, so I guess uh, procedurally, just to keep this correct, we're going to, uh, Director Becking, ask you if you would be so kind as to bring a uh, staff report, staff report? A resolution. A resolution, sorry, to this effect at next month's uh, council meeting. Okay, I see the mayor's hand up. Mayor, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Just a question to the clerk in particular on this. Uh, can we not just direct staff through this being ratified at council minutes next month, which would then allow staff to be able to refund this money um, uh, versus a specific direct staff report from Director Becking to come to us uh, at the end of the day? Uh, the minutes of this meeting would reflect that staff, uh, in my opinion, would be authorized to respond to this and it would be ratified at council, at which point in September it could be done. Just a question. Well, ask the clerk. Lauren? I'd recommend based on the procedural bylaw that a resolution is put on the agenda so the public 
public has notice of the decision that's going to happen and they won't be able to review those minutes on the agenda with sufficient notice. So that would be my recommendation. Oh, okay, so given that position, uh, make some sense there. Uh, Councillor Robertson Edwards, and then we'll move on. Uh, just uh, uh, a question of, or, of uh, procedure to the clerk. Um, I understand that possibly at some point in time in the next few weeks, we could go into a lame duck. I, this is a small amount of money, but does it apply? Just, uh, I don't know. Or This is below the limit that it would affect that sort of decision. Okay. Okay, Councillor uh, Edwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Zavich. I'd like to see us bring forward a, a policy revision so that service clubs that don't have to go through this is taking up council time, it takes up staff time and everything else like that. We normally give it back, so why not get the policy that the service clubs get it without having to pay for it? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. And I'm wondering if uh, at next month's uh, economic development meeting, we could discuss that and perhaps follow it through that way. Uh, just a thought, okay. So, okay, committee, given, given what we've uh, discussed, uh, we, th we have agreement and uh, uh, Director uh, Becking, you have your, Walking order. So thank you for that. I see the uh, CAO has his hand up. Just hang on a sec. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just for clarity, uh, it may be that uh, Mr. Backing uh, confers with uh, Mr. Moore and potentially comes back through this committee uh, with respect to a report on revisiting the policy. So just a clarification, uh, uh, and we'll be happy to come back uh, perhaps. Uh, Mr. Beckham can uh, consider if it's going to be September, October, uh, based on his workload as well. But uh, we'll definitely uh, come back to uh, committee. Thank you. Good. Well, th I think that's a that's been a good result here, and I look forward to continuing on this discussion. So, uh, with that, Mr. Hewitt, I'll uh, thank you for your time and uh, thank you for your service, sir, and, and your your club and hopefully you feel uh, like you're a vital part of this uh, wonderful community. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Sure. Have, have a good day. Take care. You too. Okay. It's 10 o'clock. We're at item 4C. I'm wondering if we should take a 10 minute break or perhaps we'll deal with this and then move on to a, a break maybe around 10, 15. So here we are item 4C uh, looking to Mr. Longo and Adam Brook to attend read the church dock boat launch. Um, we have these folks here. Anyone? They're here. So there's a presentation, is there? Okay, good. Leo, are you there? Mr. Longo? Adam? We can't hear you. We're ready to uh, entertain your presentation. Apologize for the 30 minute wait. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, we're maybe having some difficulties with these gentlemen on item 4C. How about we, uh, we jump down into item 4D? Do we have David Coatsworth in the... Uh... David's not here either. Oh. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me now? There you go, there you go. Mr. Longo, welcome, welcome. There you go. Sorry, there was a difficulty with the uh, unmuting the connection. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Zavitz and committee members. I'm here on behalf of uh, Adam uh, Brook and his uh, neighbors to deal with the Church Dock Road. I was in front of you two months ago uh, with this project. 
since that time, we've received some FOI disclosures, and I have a brief uh, uh, slide presentation to present. Uh, first slide, please. In 1992, the um, federal government prepared this uh, slide of its uh, government dock at Church Dock Road. And as you know, in 1997, this uh, property was conveyed to the municipality. Next slide, please. In 2020, uh, a more up-to-date uh, survey was prepared that reflects not only the original uh, government dock, which is at the bottom of this slide in that square water lot that uh, coincides with the previous slide, but you'll see to the north of that a barge loading area. And uh, further to the um, uh, left of that, a, a boat lodge floating dock. Uh, so if you could appreciate uh, this when going to the next slide, in 2020, the uh, committee decided to review church uh, road dock uh, boat lodge and indicated that it wanted simply three ramps. One, a recreational ramp. Two, a single limited use commercial ramp. And number three, a single full service ramp. So that's what you were intending to provide two years ago when this committee dealt with this. If we could go to the next slide, um, you'll see signage was posted uh, on the landing. On the left of this slide, the lower area is the limited uh, commercial um, ramp. To the right of this slide is the principal commercial ramp. And you can see some boulders were placed uh, there, I think in an effort to prevent more than one a barge uh, utilizing the site at any particular time. If we could go to the next uh, slide, I want to show, make five points to the committee. The first is that two barges use this property regularly. Here's a photo just showing how the rocks that were placed don't really prevent uh, a second barge from utilizing uh, this property. So point number one to take away is that we don't believe what committee did in 2020 is being followed. There are two barges being used. You could see the limited commercial dock over on the right side. What's out of this picture on the left side is where the recreational dock is, the original government dock. Next slide, please. Second thing is silt gets kicked up all the time by these barges. This is a photo that came out of the FOI uh, uh, disclosure. You could see how shallow this water is. And um, I had a video that unfortunately can't show you. The way some of these barges get out from this area is they actually push the, excavate, the excavator bins into the muddy bottom of the lake and attempt to push off. And that creates silt. Uh, dis, uh, disturbance and there's in the FOI uh, disclosures indication of water intake uh, pipes being uh, clogged by this constant turning of the water due to these bigger barges coming in and disturbing the uh, bottom. Lil, Next slide. I wonder, I wonder if I could just interrupt for a moment. If you could go yeah. back, can we go back a slide? I just want to see there was a date stamp. Am I so? So 11 25 2019. Oh, you're right. Yeah, you're right. That's that is prior to the right. and that's the reason why this committee okay. acted what they did. So I just wanted I'll, to thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much for that. Go ahead. I will show you. Thank you. Here's where a, a third problem comes up. They're excavate, they're using uh, excavators to actually unload bins. If you if you look at this picture, this was actually just yesterday. Uh, an excavator goes out on the barge and drags a bin into the area. If go to the next slide. You'll see how these things uh, have, have been moved around uh, using these equipment rather than proper, uh, proper vehicles to, uh, to, to take them away. 
Uh, next slide, please. You see some things do come in, not in bins, but um, just loose like that. And then finally, if I can ask, you'll see uh, here, uh, uh, again, this is one that, that is 2019. Uh, so it, you see the two uh, uh, barges, but this slide is more uh, for the point of showing that this landing is being used almost as personal yards or private yards of the excavating companies. There's no room at all for the public to access the recreational dock, which is to the left. And uh, these bins and these vehicles are, are basically there uh, most of the day, uh, not um, adhering to the four hour uh, uh, time period. So there, the ask of uh, my client is, could you please uh, treat this landing as you did the Adams Bay Birch Avenue landing and either cut off commercial, the large commercial barges? My client wants to make it clear he's not asking that, that limited commercial uh, barges be uh, prohibited. Those, as you know, are regulated by size. Limited doesn't need duration. Limited is size. Client is content to have limited commercial barges here anytime when they are permitted during the day. It's these large commercial barges that are stirring up the bay that are using this as their private landing when Bay Cliff is just down the road. Okay, so so thank you. that's my submission, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd ask that council uh, consider that amendment and ask that it not wait for slot number nine, as mentioned by Mr. Kennedy in his previous deputation, but that you act now and limit church dock to limited commercial and recreation only. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you for that. Okay, do we have, um, save uh, Mr. Longo's presentation, do we have a copy of our own, of the township, in terms of what the committee passed, uh, which he referenced in his presentation? Or should we put that up again for the benefit of the committee? That wasn't the general finance resolution, not a, not a council resolution. Right, so was it, and it never... We weren't asked to... Take that out of our minutes. That's fine. So, okay. Uh, Fair enough. If we could then just put that back up, if, we, if you don't mind, from Mr. Longo's presentation. Um, so as I'm, I'm aware, being made aware here and now that that was what we'll be seeing again in a moment is um, a resolution passed by general and finance, but in my understanding, it not ratified at council. I can't confirm. Okay, we can't. Yeah. History, right on. Okay. So. I guess if we could just put that up there just for the committee's uh, benefit. Um, we, yeah, here we go. Here we go. So we, we cannot at this point in time, uh, because this is a for information only, there's no resolution attached to this or motion attached to this uh, topic. Um, we cannot and do not and are not prepared at this point to uh, to, to get into those records and provide that information. What we do know is that the uh, General Finance Committee uh, resolved to council that this, uh, this be enacted. Uh, so I guess my question would be to, um, uh, I guess to um, our enforcement bylaw officer, if he's still here, Rob Kennedy, um, are you aware? Have we been aware? Have we got eyes on here that, that shows us enforcing the, uh, you know, the, the implications of that motion that was passed back then. Is Rob here? Right here. Oh, here you go, Rob. Yeah, Can you um, oh, yeah I'll, I'll only be here for a few more minutes. I have to jump over to a court case. Um, but uh, through the chair, uh, this situation, we've, we've received a number of complaints in the last couple of years in regards to the use of this dock. Um, every time we've gone there, aside from maybe one or two, there's been a contravention. Uh, what happens is usually in the morning, a barge operator will drop off an excavator at the property or at the church dock landing. And then I would say maybe an hour or two later, 
the barge arrives and they load their materials, which as per the bylaw is permitted. They're allowed to unload and load materials however they please. Um, and regardless if this excavator is parked in the no parking area, one, they're going to be using it. Um, and two, there is no license plate for an excavator. So we can't really do anything as far as a parking bylaw goes in regards to that. Um, the, as far as the recreational launch goes, we have never ever received any type of complaint or concern from a recreational user on that dock saying that commercial users are blocking them. Um, there's been numerous times where either myself or uh, officer miners have gone over and talked to the contractors and they've always said that if a recreational user comes up, they will move their stuff and allow them to use that dock. But as I said, we've never, ever received any type of complaints that they are blocking the recreational dock at any point in time. Um, but as I said, we've received a number of complaints um, from a few members of the public, uh, but as long as they're using it as permitted in the docks and ramps bylaw, there's nothing for us that we can that we can enforce in this situation. Okay, are you satisfied that we're having enough eyes on this? Seems to me it's it's almost an enforcement issue. If, if we're well aware that people are contravening, then we should be working with those people to stop that practice. Uh, how does that seem to you? Well, through the chair, as I said, there there is no contravention. If they're loading and unloading materials at the at the property, then they're allowed to do so. That's that's what a commercial landing is for: is to load and unload materials. Mm -hmm. Um, trucks and whatever they need to get out to these islands to do the work. So what we have not found any contravention. Big yellow machines there for days on end. Is that occurring or are they, they taking those machines in and out? It, those are being removed in and out. Uh, we have never seen any record of them being leave for more than a couple hours at a time, wow. even if even if that. Good to know. Good to know. Okay. Thank you for that. And if you have to go, thanks for your time. Um, I'm going to call on the mayor and then uh, Councillor uh, Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think Mr. Kennedy answered uh, most of my questions that generally speaking, uh, assuming that uh, we did pass a council resolution, resolution to have limited commercial and a full commercial ramp at that particular location. Um, it appears that we are following that bylaw um, <clears throat> and uh, or according to Mr. Kennedy. So I'm not sure what we can do differently. Um, for council to consider um, changing the bylaw to eliminate commercial activity. That's a much broader discussion um, and uh, one that honestly today I would not wanna have. Good, thank you. Uh, I see Mr. Longo, you have your hand up. I, I might allow a comment. I, I, I thank you very briefly. One of the enforcement issues deals with the stirring up of the bay and bylaw says that's not our job that's a provincial job or something. So that whole environmental issue just can't get looked at by staff and it seems to be ignored uh, everywhere. That's a real concern. And there is storage going on. Unfortunately, you've got two officers who can't be everywhere at all times, but the client advises bins are stored there all day and they're using that storage area to actually break up things and then put them in bids. It's not just loading and unloading, it's actually bringing materials in and then doing activities on your land that's more than loading and unloading. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, Councillor Roberts. Uh, through you, Chair, to um, uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, Rob, I don't have it in front of me right now. What is the date uh, of the bylaw that stipulates that the uh, church dock is good for uh, commercial, light commercial, and and uh, and uh, recreation. No, it's with a date. Rob, uh, Councillor Roberts, just to clarify, you want the the year of the bylaw that was passed? Yeah, the year it's it would be right in the bylaw, wouldn't it? Or, no, uh, whatever. Well, the, yeah, the yeah, the original bylaw was 2003-29, um, and the most recent uh, update was in 2014 under bylaw 2014-94. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I can't see everyone here. I don't know what's going on with my screen, but I can only see some people.
Oh, my sister. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Seeing no other hands. Um, okay. So I guess with the with the uh, as the merit said, what the the presumption that this uh, actually passed at council uh, back then, um, it seems to me that this is an eyes on enforcement issue. Mr. Longo has done, a, I think, a incredible job of, of uh, stating his, con his client's concerns. And I think we as a township need to be looking at that. Uh, there's no re resolution to, to read to that effect, but I can assure you that we will, uh, I think we will redouble our efforts there. I would ask that we do that through uh, Mr. Pink and, uh, and Rob Kennedy in terms of eyes on there. It seems that if there are some uh, transgressions happening that they need to be noted uh, by us and, and enforced. And so to that regard, I, I think I believe I can commit on behalf of this committee to yourselves that um, we, will, uh, we, we shouldn't be looking into that and we certainly will. So I hope you'll take that um, for what it is and uh, we'll thank you for your time and uh, we'll move on from there. So thank you. Take care. Okay, we're at item 4D, uh, David Coatsworth. Uh, it's 20 after 10, is he here? Is he, David? He's not okay, he's not here. So we're gonna take a 10 minute break. It's 1020 and we'll see you all back here at 1030. Thank you.
Do you guys hear that? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay, it's 1030. We, uh, we're recording. Welcome back to our August the 10th General Finance Committee meeting, Township Muskoka Lakes. We are going to be moving on. We had item 4D, David Coatsworth. Uh, he's uh, not available, not showing up. So we're gonna move on with that and we'll get invite him to come back next month. Um, we're on to item uh, E, 4E, which is delegations. I will preface that with a moving along on the agenda to 6A, which is a report from our land and agreements coordinator, read the license agreement application waterhouse rule 7, Dash one dash zero three six dash zero one. We have a report from Chriselle Story. Uh, go ahead, Chriselle. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair Zavitz, and good morning, Committee. The townships received a license agreement application for the encroachment of a dock that is situated on a township road allowance leading to Moon River. Staff have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. Staff are recommending that this application be defeated and the encroachment be removed from township land. If there are any questions regarding the process, our clerk or Director Pink are available to answer or regarding the property itself, Director Becking. And with that said, I will turn it back to the chair. Thanks, Chriselle. Uh, okay, uh, committee will now hear from the delegations as they're listed in your uh, agenda today. Uh, so I would invite Sue Waterhouse to uh, come on camera first. I want everyone to be aware you each have uh, five minutes. If it's going to be repetitive, if you will, then we would ask you somehow to just sort of uh, fold in with the others uh, that you're working with. So Sue Waterhouse, welcome, and uh, you've got the floor. Okay, Sue, we can't, we can't hear you, Sue, so. Can you hear me now? We can, welcome, there you go. Hi, thank you, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Waterhouse. Um, my property is directly opposite the roadway leading down to the dock in question on uh, Sandor Drive. According uh, to my agreement of purchase and sale when I purchased the property in uh, 2015 and the dock was included in the agreement of purchase and sale, um, I purchased my house and dock as many of my neighbors did with the understanding I had full access to the laneway and dock. Myself and many of my neighbors have enjoyed the access to the water and dock um, for the past 44 years without complaint or incident. On the Friday of May 20th, um, in late afternoon on the long weekend, I received quite a threatening notice stapled to the dock and nearby tree giving the dock owner seven days to remove or start the license agreement application or the dock would be removed and disposed of. This really only gave me the three days because it was a long weekend and the office, by the time I seen the notice, the office was closed. So <clears throat> my understanding from many of my neighbors and Mr. Healy is that Mr. Healy is the one that um, built the roadway and the dock 44 years ago and he had township permission. I, so I came down on the following Tuesday, it would have been because it was the long weekend and I applied for the license agreement. Um, I, I applied for this license agreement under duress, feeling quite threatened that I was gonna lose my dock uh, or the dock uh, that was down uh, the laneway. Um, so I have applied, for, I also asked, so I applied for freedom of information, but as of yet, I have not heard back from the township with any information that I requested. Um, I had informed the township that myself and or my lawyer wished to make representation to this committee or council once the freedom of information request had been fully answered. Uh, to date, I haven't received anything. 
So I'm asking for a, um, a request in that any further hearing or decision made by committee or council uh, be postponed so that I may consider my position and make a fully informed representation. I am consulting with a lawyer and I need the Freedom of Information documents in time to review my position with him. You know, this, this matter I don't feel is urgent at the time. It's not time sensitive as the doc's been there without complaint or any incident for 44 years. And additionally, I'm not even sure if it's clear that the docks on township land are is, as it's located within the high water area. So I'm still in the process of reviewing the title and background. I have many questions regarding ownership by adverse possession. Was an easement granted in 1979 by express intention, although not registered? Um, I did speak to the township and they've informed me that they have no records of uh, Mr. Healy uh, and the dock. Um, so whatever Mr. Healy is referring to, they have no record of this. Um, this dock has been in continuous use without incident for 44 years and maintained by myself, my partner, Lou Gazzola, and many, many neighbours over the years. The township has not taken any measure to remove the dock for the past 44 years. My question is, why not? Um, again, I am asking for a full postponement uh, in your decision. And I just want to thank you all for your time. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Sue. Okay. So next up would be Lou Gazzola. He's your partner. So he's right there. Mr. Gazzola, welcome. You're on mute. We can't hear you. Yeah. Okay. How's that? There you go. Good stuff. Pretty good. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Good morning. All right. Uh, my name is Lou Gazzola. Uh, my partner, Sue Waterhouse, and I purchased the property on 1021 Sandor Drive in the summer of 215. During the purchase of this property, it was to my understanding that the public access to the waterway was included with a dock as advertised in the real estate listing. Upon moving in, upon moving in my neighbor Bob Healy and others on Sandor Drive, who have lived there since the 1960s and 70s, informed myself about the history of the laneway. To my knowledge, Bob Healy was granted permission by council back in the 1970s to install the laneway for the fire trucks to drive to the water. He also, with permission from the township, built the original dock and repaired the road for 44 plus years until he sold his property. Uh, since 2015, myself and other neighbors have been maintaining this area, road repair, gravel purchase, fallen tree removal over the laneway, cleaning of ditches, uh, draining of standing water. Uh, myself and others in the neighborhood have enjoyed this area for swimming, fishing, boating, and access to the river with never any complaints about the condition or the safety of the road or the dock. It would be a loss of enjoyment in this area and the dock were taken away from the community and the neighborhood itself. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Gazzola, thank you for your, your comments. Um, next up would be Emily Waterhouse. Is uh, Emily, are you a bit? Oh, Emily, there's, there's Oh, Emily. no, this is not Emily. <laughs> Where are we looking at? Emily? I think, no, we're not. She was. Okay, I saw her there. there she's there. Yeah. Emily, hello. Welcome. Can you, uh, can we hear you? Is your audio working? Uh, yes, there it is. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome. And you've got five minutes. What I would ask, though, of course, is if uh, if your information is identical to the last two or three or four, that you would please sort of distill your comments to what may be new information for this committee. Thank you. Go yes, ahead. of course. Hi, I just want to uh, say good morning to everyone. And thank you. I have a little uh, <laughs> guest with me as well. Um, I just want to thank you all for your time in advance. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my partner, Owen Ludwig. He purchased his house in 2012 um, with the understanding that it came with access to the water as well as a dock down there. Um, since purchasing it, he has been involved in maintaining the laneway, as Lou said before. Um, 
I won't repeat what they've all done. Um, myself, I have been residing here for the past three years um, and we welcomed this little one in January. Um, one of the main reasons we decided to stay here to raise a family is because it allowed us the opportunity to enjoy the beauty of Muskoka, um, boating, teaching her how to swim, um, etc. So we really just, it would be heartbreaking to see um, such an important part of our community uh, taken away from us um, when it was established 44 years ago that we did have uh, access to the water. Um, so I would just like to thank you in advance for your consideration and thank you for your time. Sorry, she doesn't allow me to speak for too long. <laughs> thank you. She's definitely the youngest delegate we've ever had. <laughs> Uh, Walker, congratulations. Excellent. Okay, so uh, given that, we'll move on to Jay Taylor. Is Jay uh, Taylor in the uh, in the room? Jay Taylor. There's Jay Taylor. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Is your audio working? I'm connecting to audio. There you go. What we see, Jay, over in this end is connecting to audio. Okay, Jay, so we're just gonna park you for a moment while maybe that uh, comes into effect. Uh, is Tony Bosco available? Uh, there's Tony coming in and we'll get back to Jay. We also do have on our sub, sub agenda, uh, Tony uh, Molnar, who will be providing comment as well. No. Oh. Oh no. That's a well provided yeah, public. Sorry, that's a letter. Thank you. Okay, so Tony, looks like everybody's connecting to audio. That might be a function of internet. Hmm. Can we move on one more? So Jasmine isn't on? And Robert Healy, is he here? He was not coming? No. Okay, so we, we were aware that Robert Healy will not be making a, a representation here this morning. And we're having challenges with Jay and Tony getting them on. Oh, we know. Tony, looks like you're breaking through. Can can you turn your audio on, Tony? And uh... oh. oh, Jay's Jay. There you go, Jay. Can we hear you? Yes. Try try your audio. Speak. Just speak to us and see if we can. Dial you in. Jake, can you hear us? Maybe you can't. Jake, can you hear us? I'm not hearing us. Okay. okay, how about Tony? Tony, can you hear us or talk to us? Okay. Well, let's let them get organized. Je Jasmine Worth. Is Jasmine? Okay. None of them are working. So we're seemingly having a problem. They're all saying connecting to audio, but they're not. Tony's talking to us, but we can't hear him. We can see him. Tony, we can see you. We just don't hear you. Might help to turn off your video. It might give you a little bit more. And I'm wondering if you would, if these people, if you could give us a, an indication of if they're for or against, like if we're hearing even that information? Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if there's anyone here to speak for them. Uh, Jasmine is here now. Jasmine, can we hear you to get your audio working? Okay, your audio's off. Jasmine, we can't. You're on. Oh, mute. is that better? Oh, there you go. You're good. Okay, it okay. came up on my screen. Sorry, this is my first time, so I do apologize if I. That's great. Welcome. <laughs> We've got some time to talk to us. Go ahead. Okay, so this is regarding the dog. Um, I have notes, like I put notes in my phone, but again, first time I'm thinking, how am I supposed to read notes but be on my phone? So I just did a bit of scribbling and um, I don't know, I guess the main issue is the city wants to remove the dog. Is that, am I understanding correctly from what the neighbors are saying? Cause we've all kind of petitioned and we want it to stay. And I'm assuming it's to go because one person complained, is that? No, that, is, that, isn't, that isn't the essence of the issue at all. I'm, so I, anyway, you, I don't know if you have an actual representative, a, a spokesperson, I don't, I'm not seeing that you do, but um, so I'm not gonna really, I, I don't really think I should be prefacing why your group is here delegating today. So um, I'll, I'll just let you go on. There's a lot of people that, from what I understand that are, are, are on the same page and wanting to keep it there. And I guess the only reason it's an issue or became an issue is because one person must have complained. But I don't know, like I bought this house in 2019. And when I bought this house, it even showed in um, the disclosure of, of buying the house that, uh, where, where did I put it? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It disclosed of having offered a pop public dock and launch. Like it is part of the reason why I bought the dock. Um, I don't feel that it's causing any issue uh, when it comes to emergency response people coming in. I feel that it would even help like any emergency crews getting to it. Like you almost would have to see it to kind of understand. Like it's a small little dock. It, we live on a small little dead end street. The people on the one side of the street, they're all either homeowners, cottages, and they're, they have their own dock. So that is kind of for everybody on our side of the street. And it's for everybody on this side of the street to use. And we all do use it. There's a couple of young families that have children. And when COVID started taking like basically everything away from us, we were still able to kind of go with our children's, like our own immediate family and go down. Like I have two kids still home with me. And me and my husband, like the four of us, we would go and we would enjoy ourselves. And again, like, I don't understand why take it away. It's been there for almost 50 years. Yeah. Okay, for clarity. Now it's a problem. So Jasmine, if I might, for clarity, this is not as a result of someone complaining. Uh, what this is, is a result of... Uh, uh, the township realizing that, that this is occurring. This is all about the dock. The dock is a township property. Nobody's going to take that access away from anyone. Uh, you would be able to continue to walk down there, go in the water, use the water. Yeah, but you can't teach a four-year-old to swim without it there. Like, it's just, it's different. I understand. And I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. No, it's fine. I, you know, it's, it's very important the con that, in co that this thing is in context. Okay, this I is, understand that, and but, I'm realizing that I don't have all the context. No, no, that's fine. And so it isn't a result of one person complaining. It, it's it's the result of the township of Muskoka Lakes realizing that, in fact, um, this is has been occurring for years and years and years. And we've like had, other, yeah, there's been other examples of it. And, you know, in, in the effort to be consistent, um, that's why this thing has come forward uh, today. So well, there I am. There you go. Okay, so, it, Anyway, Jasmine, do you have other comments or are you good? Um, I think it should stay. I think, I'm, I guess I'm good for now. Like, will you come revisit me or? Uh, no, what we will do though, is invite you to stay on here and watch and listen and uh, committee will have comments. Staff uh, may well have comments and then we'll make a final decision when we reach, uh, when we read, when I read the, uh, the motion in front of us. Now, I would refer all of you to the agenda, the agenda package, which is very clear in a staff report that is included in that agenda package that um, has a staff recommendation at the very top of it. If, you, if none of you have read it, I suggest you should, because um, there's some pretty specific content in there. So hopefully you have. So with that, uh, you know, let me go back up with Sissy for a second. Okay, Jasmine, thank you for your time. Stick, stick around and, and like I say, you're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, I'm gonna...
fight. Um, I think Tony is it Tony Tony Bosco, right? Yeah, that's me. Hey Tony, welcome, sir. And uh, I'm going to give you your time. Go ahead. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you again. Hold on. Uh, my name's Tony Bosco. I live at 1017 Sandor Drive. As you've heard everybody else say, I help participate quite a bit. It's a great neighborhood. Everybody on the street seems to get along just fine. John down the street will give me a call when he needs help. I help grade everybody's uh, driveway, including the doc. Um, I have two grandkids who are enjoying that water as well. One is autistic and trying to explain to him they like routines. He gets to go there once a week and go for a swim. And uh, I've had to take him out. I might get him out on the boat once a year to do some uh, tubing. And we enjoy the lake. I've been coming to Muskoka Lakes for over 50 years, as I've told you. I spent all my money here keeping the towns going and renting and eating at the restaurants, which I continue to do now. I see no need. Why? I mean, one of the reasons I bought my house was it was said that we had it. And it all went through the lawyers, everything. I had access to it. The pictures were there. I go up and down that river, nice and quietly. People don't even know I'm there. And then when they see me, I get a good, good wave. So I get along with everybody I get by on that river. And I don't see, and no one's ever made a complaint about it. Not once did anybody say anything to us that we could address or solve a situation. As Jasmine, I do not understand why this is happening. As you told me about the document I'm supposed to read, I'm not a great techie guy, right? I believe in talking to people face to face and knowing what's going on. But I've been in the dark trying to figure, well, we'll let you know when you could do something. But I mean, I spoke to you the one time we've never spoke again. I don't know what the issue is. No one still told us what is the issue. I don't understand why it's such a hard thing for this council to say, here's why. Why do I got to go dig something up? Why can't you just tell me? It's the decent thing to do. Don't you agree? Like, why do I have to okay. find all that? Tony, are you there? We're losing you. Can you can we we can't hear you? Oh come on, really? No, we can't I'm saying I'm saying I am saying, right? Can you hear me now? Oh, now we can, we can hear you. Fine. Yep. Yeah, great. Thank okay. You. Okay. Thank God. As I was saying, I don't see why it's such a secret as to why this is happening or what is trying to be accomplished here when there's been no issue with it, and not not one person on council has said to me. This is why we are doing this. I mean, we I see there's probably people from all around that use that. There's boats going up and down there, spring and fall. And we help them. And we maintain it. Like, you haven't made, you, you yourself told me, you've never maintained it and you never will. And I don't understand that. Like, how come I can't get an answer? Well, okay, okay. So, if that's your presentation, again, I, I, this is not veiled in mystery. There is no surprise here. Uh, the, the township Muskoka Lakes does not recognize that access to water as a as a landing, as a launch ramp, as a park. It, it isn't any of those. It isn't it. Well, we, we're not going to disagree at, at all here. Um, it isn't. It isn't any of those things. I would refer you when I said to you earlier, uh, Tony, about the agenda item. Uh, and there was a supplementary agenda that the, the Moon River Property Owners Association sent in a letter um, in total support of the township's resolution that is here in front of us. So, you know, all the information is in front of us. Uh, okay, I know, but you're not telling me yet, right? No, no, no. So there's no secret. Of course, I gotta tell you whatever you want to hear, but I would refer you to the letter that, that we have from them, as you know, which represents 160 uh, homeowners on the Moon River. And they're saying, not unlike Gaunt Bay last year, where it was a unanimously um, 
uh, voted to remove the dock that was a, a, a private dock in a public place on a, a you know on a, a access to water uh, which the township of Muskoka Lakes doesn't allow in any of the in any of its lakes rivers and and streams so th there's no secret to this is I don't, I don't want you to think this is veiled in secrecy it's not this is absolutely you and I are sitting here in a public process in a public venue. We only work in the public uh, domain. So I work for you as a public servant, as do all the people you see on the screen. So I, I would I would uh, thank you for your time. I would ask that Jay Taylor, um, if Jay is available, I, he seems to have dropped off the screen here. We would like to hear from him if he's available, he's gone. but he's gone. Okay, he's gone and uh, Robert Healy will not be speaking. Um, Galaxy A03. Yeah, do we have a Galaxy uh, phone here? Galaxy, somebody or other? We have somebody here, but they, we would let them in. Let's let them in. Let's see who that is. Galaxy A03S. Is that Jay? Okay, well, what we'll do, just in the interest of keeping this moving, because we do have a full full slate here today, I'll uh, ask the mayor, I'll, I'll talk to the uh, call on the committee here for some comments. Uh, mayor Harding, then uh, Councillor Roberts, then Councillor Nishikawa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the uh, residents of Sandor Drive for uh, bringing this to our attention today. Um, I, I do believe it was originally a complaint that was filed with our bylaw that alerted it to the attention uh, of the township. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is in front of us today. Uh, there is a dock on Township Road allowance uh, leading to water and uh, presents a problem for all of council that we're going to try and solve, hopefully, um, and a little bit of understanding. My specific question at this point would be to staff. Number one, are we aware of other <laughs> private docks? Um, that would have been installed on road allowances. There's no question this is a feature and a benefit for all those who do not have water access to Sandor. Um, we, we talk about preserving our uh, water access uh, properties. And um, this is an opportunity where somehow along the way, the residents or somebody decided to put in a dock. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something or do we have others to be consistent across where we are? I do know for a point of history, we used to have a uh, a dock at uh, Harris Street Park in Port Carling at one point that we lost in the flood. It never got replaced. I don't know if it was a resident at the time who had done that. Um, I, I guess I would like to see an opportunity through staff, if there's an opportunity, to be able to have the residents of Sandor maintain a dock keep a dock and remove the township from liability along the way, is that a possibility to move this thing forward? The other thing, as it is a public uh, access, I would not want to see any overnight parking. One of the uh, photos in the agenda package has two boats in particular parked at the dock. Uh, it would be pickup loading and unloading only. I would not want to see a boat parked over there. I certainly wouldn't want to see any resident using it as their own private dock. So uh, Director Becking, I think maybe might be the best um, to help us where we may or may not go um, or where we've been with other um, road access leading to water. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, several questions. I'll try and unpack them. Uh, with respect to other locations, um, I'm not aware of any active uh, situations. Um, we try and discourage, discourage these things uh, for, for uh, reasons of, of uh, liability, uh, to say the very least. Um, fundamentally, uh, the public has the right to use a road allowance. Uh, they, however, do not have the right to modify that road allowance in any way, shape, or form in order to make it suitable for a, a given purpose. And that's, I think, the fundamental principle that's in play here. Uh, with respect to um, uh, leaving the existing dock in place, you could choose to do so. Um, it, it does uh, uh, run contrary to, to other decisions that... that uh, Council has made in in the past. 
uh, nonetheless, you could choose to to waive that if you wish. Uh, to do so would re would require a um, some kind of an agreement to be put in place. Um, if council is concerned about liability, then obviously there would be a need for insurances to be put in place in order for that to to be addressed. Just a supplemental, if I may, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I guess at one point then. Um, and I'll let discussion go, but uh, I might be interested in just exploring some of those opportunities, whether or not we could transfer this infrastructure, because I think it certainly enhances our infrastructure in this area that there's a dock there. But if we could transfer this somehow to the community um, and liability, but I don't know what that would specifically look like at this particular point. Yes, it may be a unique uh, process, but um uh, I certainly hear the community that this is for a small road, um, an opportunity for them to experience Muskoka waterfront. And uh, anyway, I'd like to potentially look at other alternatives than just potentially a blanket. Don't remove it at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Cord, you're muted. You're muted. Thank you. Okay, just for everyone's um, information, I am also experiencing um, sound problems, and I have all morning, and so and many of the delegates. So, so um, I want to through you, Chair. Um, I just want to give some background and experience and suggestion here. Um, I have a lot of experience in this area, not per se the dock, but maintenance of a road, and I've done it for over. 30, 40 years in maintaining a township not maintained property of a kilometer, two kilometers long. I played a key role in maintaining it and we put $10,000 a year in it. Um, we are, um, we are uh, recognized per se by the township. First of all, Len Troop, and then by Roger Young, who director of public works. And there was a meeting with Dr. Pink and the president of the, the, the road association to notify him what, what we do on Leonard Lake road one about, um, and this is for the, 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 the delegates to be very aware of this and to directly ask, answer Mr. Bosco's question, why? It's everything to do about liability. Because with you uh, contributing, what we understood with us, and we went through FOCA, we involved insurance uh, in lawyers. If we do it, did any work on township property that, that, that uh, we had a duty of continuance, we must do it forever to do repairs and insurance safety. And it was strongly recommended that we incorporate because if, if there is an issue there, you, every member that contributed to that doc will be personally sued. So we incorporated, we got insurance through FOCA, and there's an insurance company that can connect you with that will give you a quote for insurance. And now everyone who is a member, a paid member, so we have a, a fee, uh, they, they are uh, insured under the liability insurance. So I strongly recommend that you, you do that. So let's go through, I'm gonna be a little long here, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just uh, uh, your um, due diligence or allow me to do this. This has been in 44 years. We've had a lot of public input that is 44 years. We're also probably aware that township employees of some sort have been aware of this mm -hmm. and probably that councillors have been aware of this. Um, I understand that, they, that the records, it never did come to any official meeting so I fully understand why the, 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 the township says we have, we have no record of, uh, of this ever happening. Um, from a real estate point of view, people said in real estate, you have to really take all, I'm sorry for saying this, but you have to take all real estate articles with a grain of salt and validate it all because they're selling property. They're not, uh, they're in no position to say what the policies are. And, um, so now here's my suggestion, and this is based on years of experience. Um, you need to get a liability insurance. It'd be foolish for the township to take out the, 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 the dock or the road 
given that our master transportation plan um, has said that we're going to look at this kind of stuff, we have, um, uh, it'd be foolish to take it out if we say we're going to put it in. It says in the report that we need access to the Moon River. So on this particular case, I think we should uh, strike up an agreement with this association, with their insurance. We got to be very careful here because throughout Milford Bay, I have a constituent who insists that we open up all uh, accesses to water. And that just can't happen because of all the liability and the cost associated with it. So uh, we got to worry about the precedent setting. So you need to get an, an insured um, uh, be, and the township be named as an insured uh, party on your policies. And with that, I think we defer this or we, we on this only single one throughout Muskoka. The one on uh, on the bay that we talked about last year, the dock had just appeared and we said, get it out of there because we did. So this one's been there for 45 years. So I think we need to partnership with this and then through the through the master transportation plan, decide what we're going to do and through the uh, the recreation um a master plan, et cetera, et cetera. But this, this one here, we should allow some sort of lenience and, and partnership with the township. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Becking, before we move on to the other committee. Remember? Just uh, a, a couple of points further to Councillor Roberts' comments. Um, I would suggest that uh, before we proceed too far, I think uh, getting some uh, advice from our solicitor would be would be in order. I think the other uh, issue that I would remind committee of is the fact that, uh, as you're aware, we do have a, TM, a transportation master plan currently underway. The mandate of that study is uh, includes uh, consideration of appropriate access to major water bodies throughout the township, and um, and I think that. Um, we want to uh, to uh, pay heed to, or at least give that process an opportunity to to see itself through to some uh, form of conclusion before any any uh, permanent decisions are taken. Good, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Nishikawa, then Councillor Kelly, then we'll uh, move on. Thank you. I um, uh, thank you for your comments, Mr. Becking, because I was along the same lines. I would request that we would not be removing this dock for this season. Um, liability aside, I can tell you at least 10 locations just in Ward A that um, the public have taken access to off of Crown land and or municipal land. Um, there are all these little secret hidden, hidden gems. If you're a hiker, you really know about them. Um, so if the township is concerned about, or if, if committee is concerned about the liability, we got a much bigger problem going on than this particular dock. So I would suggest that we leave this in place for the time being until we get a full understanding. But in reality, from my perspective, this location, this dock, same same with, um, where's Donaldo when I need it, need her, but we had the same situation that happened on River Street in Bala, and someone opened up the road allowance next door to a, a, a person's property, and, um, and we dealt with that. And in fact, there's still that opening available to the public used today. Doesn't happen to get used as much anymore, interestingly enough. But so all, all I'm saying is that I'd like to everything to be left in place, and that in fact, in the future, I would see that this would be a public launch. I'm, I'm not necessarily interested in getting into private relationships uh, with a, a group of people who then would say, you know, I couldn't walk down there and take my, you know, dog for a swim, something like that. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's a public road allowance and that we, it should be remained open for the public. And that, by the way, guys, is also the public that can come from anywhere. So you could get all kinds of neighbors that you don't know of, but that is the reality. But that's the the way that the direction that I think we go. But mostly leave everything in place till the end of the season. Good, thank you, Councillor uh, Kelly. 
Uh, thank you. And through you, I've, I've got a couple of questions um, and, and then uh, a comment. Um, first, I, I, I need to understand a little bit better about how this thing has, has um, resided where it has for the last 40 some odd years. Uh, my recollection of the law of adverse possession is that uh, that uh, that law, which grants rights after certain times of occupation, doesn't apply to um, municipally owned land. I don't know if anybody knows the answer to that, but I think we would need to know the answer before we do anything. Mr. Becking seems to know. Go ahead, Ken. No, oh, you're muted, Ken. Sorry about that. Um, Councillor Kelly is correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the public cannot gain uh, rights to uh, municipal road allowances um, by adverse possession. Um, uh, they are, are exempt from those rules. That having been said, that those rules, in my understanding, do not extend to all publicly owned lands, only road allowances. Okay. Good, thank you. Okay, Thank you. Uh, Kelly? Yeah, uh, my second question, and, and it's for some of the delegates, is uh, you know you're in a very uh, sympathetic situation, but I'm just trying to make sure I understand. I heard several of you say that part of the decision you made when you purchased your home was a reliance on either real estate advertising or some other communication you received that said comes with the dock. I don't know if it said comes with the dock in the river, but comes with a dock. Um, I, I'm going to go on a, on a limb and suggest that, that whoever you used as, as counsel to close your real estate deal would have covered that off somehow. And I think it would be very helpful to understand how they covered off the issue that gave you the comfort to go ahead and close your deal. It might give us a clue about where this right came from. So if you have something like that, uh, I mean, not to me, don't send it to me, but I think that would be something that you'd want to gather up and we might want to have a look at. Uh, the third thing, uh, I, I am a big proponent of improving and increasing the access for permanent residents to uh, the waterway, uh, to the water, uh, uh, the water bodies here. I think that's a, a, a good mission, and I think that's part of leading the growth of our of our community. But I don't think that we are being leaders when we sort of abdicate or delegate responsibility to people to make decisions about where and when and how they get built and if they get maintained and, and uh, whether there's appropriate parking or not. Uh, I also know that if we have one dock there today and it gets approved, there may be three there next week. And I don't know how we say no once we say yes. So if I think the Parks and Trails master plan comes back and says we need to do a better job, then I think the township needs to be the one that steps up and takes responsibility for creating the asset that is the dock and the parking area and the rules and the conditions and the maintenance, make sure it's accessible to all people of all infirmities and so forth. I, 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 just, I just can't believe we would not want control over that. Um, that helps contain the liability. It, it, it helps us cover the liability, uh, but it also makes sure that it is truly accessible and available to an appropriate standard to, to all of our constituents, not just to the people that live on the street where the dock is close. Uh, so I think we need to you know, continue down this path. Uh, I think there's work, good work being done by the Mas uh, Parks and Trails Master Plan. And if indeed this is what, what's necessary or called for to open up access to water, we're gonna find out the right access points. Uh, and then I think we need to, as a township, step up and do whatever we have to do to do it properly. Uh, but that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards and Councillor Jagos. Thank you very much, Chair Zavitz. Um, I, I uh, in full agreement of leaving the uh, talk in at this time. And um, I think what we should be doing is looking at the uh, master transportation plan. Uh, the lease agreement, the way it was drawn up is to maybe one family, which uh, I don't think is right because the, all the neighbors are using it. So they should have access to it. So I wouldn't do, go that way. Uh, uh, Councillor Roberts had a, a good su uh, suggestion if they are going to be used and we're not taking over the dock that they should incorporate, get, get legal counsel on it and lease it. And uh, as far as leasing the land, 
Uh, it, since they've been maintaining it for 45 years, I would not lease it at our lease rates. Uh, it's the community. I would say a dollar a, a, a year if they have to take over and insure it and that. But I think maybe the township should be looking at, at this and uh, providing some something. But uh, as long as it's unlimited use for all the neighbors, I don't see a problem with it at all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to suggest to the committee that we um, uh, that we um, honour the request made by one of the delegates. Uh, Sue Waterhouse asked for a deferral of this matter, um, and her reasons were because there had been a request for from freedom of information. She mentioned a bunch of, a bunch of legal comments, and I believe she and probably the other people would like to be able to consider their options. I also heard the comments that the mayor made. He also indicated that possibly we shouldn't uh, deal with this today. And, and certainly, uh, um, um, uh, Mr. Gore, uh, Councillor Roberts indicated his situation with Township Land. I have a similar situation in, in mind. And also I heard Director Becking said he'd like to get a legal opinion. But I think for all those reasons, it would just make sense to defer this uh, so that it can be studied uh, better. So I, I would, uh, if there was a seconder, I'd certainly move that. Thank you. Okay, it looks like Director Becking seconding it. <laughs> Director Becking, go ahead, I'll give you that thought. Although we do have a seconder based on your comments, Councillor Jaguars. Ken, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I think uh, perhaps uh, Councillor Nishikawa probably uh, came closest to, to hitting the mark um, in her comments. Um, the, uh, I think if, if committee were, were agreeable um, to refer the matter to staff, uh, we will undertake a, uh, or, or consult with our, our solicitor to, to uh, uh, develop a, a, uh, an approach to dealing with the issues at hand. Um, uh, that there be no uh, action taken in the short term, at least for the balance of this season. Uh, that will also give the, the transportation master plan an opportunity to see itself through to some form of logical conclusion so that you then can base a decision at some point in, in uh, 2023. Um, uh, based on, on uh, the recommendations and, and uh, uh, you, you can make a, an informed final decision. Good. That's a great summary and thank you for that. Uh, so it looks to be a defer and refer scenario that we're, we find ourselves in. I'm going to look to committee now, um, given what uh, some of these fine folks have just said, uh, where are we on that? A show of hands, are we going to defer and refer this? I won't read the motion. We'll put it, we'll set it aside. I'm all for that. Uh, I think we have, okay, we have, it's deferred. So thank you all for your time and your energy. Well taken, points well taken, well made. And um, we will come back, we'll, it'll be noted on the next agenda. I'm not gonna put any, anything at Ken, you know, whether he can do it in, uh, into September when he comes back or uh, whatever, but you've got your doc for the foreseeable future for its continued use. Thank you for that. Have a great day. Okay. David Coatsworth, as it relates to Camp Jackson Road. Okay, we're going to let David in. David Coatsworth. So we're connecting to audio. This is, um, where is the item here in the supplementary? On the regular agenda. Oh, there he is. Okay. okay, you're muted. Welcome, David. David, you're muted. You there your... we go. Welcome. There you go. Hi. Thank you for bringing me back into the meeting. I had a little uh, technical issue to overcome, but uh, you're now. Thank you. 
Uh, no, no, I'm. Go ahead. We can hear you. I believe yeah. he's listening to the webcast on the background. There's about a. I am going to kill that. And um, yeah, there we go. Can you hear me now? We can. We can hear you fine. Go ahead. Yes. So I, I submitted a, a letter. I don't know if it was circulated or, or read. Uh, I'm happy to go over that again. It was. And we just wanted, wanted an opportunity to, um, you know, to, to answer any questions or you know, dive further, further into the issue. But uh, essentially the um, uh, activity and development <clears throat> along Camp Jackson Road and connected to it <clears throat> over the uh, recent years has increased uh, substantially. And there's a lot of wintertime usage now. And um, we formed uh, an association to uh, look after the plowing of not only Camp Jackson, but um, the, uh, two or three roads that are connected to it and uh, wanted to make the request to uh, the council to um, have Muskoka Lakes take over the plowing, at least of the Camp Jackson Road portion up to Road 1213. And uh, there were a number of reasons that we outlined in the, in the, in the letter, uh, you know, primarily that it's a, it's a similar road to others in the area that do get plowing. It's, it's a road of substantial size. It's not just a small laneway. <clears throat> and, um, it's also connected to Moon River Road, which does get plowed. And you know, by our estimates, it would be another 20 to 30 minutes uh, of plowing time, you know, per, per plow whenever the plow comes by. So for, you know, for the, that and, and, and uh, you know, those are the sort of the primary reasons that like, we'd like to be uh, included in the winter plowing regime. So. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Um, yeah. Once, once again, just to get you to step aside for a moment, we'll invite uh, Director Becking to come in. Um, uh, perhaps while he's doing that, I'll ask uh, Councillor Bridgman, you go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Chair Zavitz. I'd rather wait till uh, Mr. Becking gives us some of his background and thoughts, if you don't mind. Fine, thank you. There he is, Director Becking. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, uh, the I guess fundamentally, uh, it's a it's an issue for council to decide. It's a change in level of service. I would point out to you that the current year's budget is um, based on on uh, the road network as it exists at the present time, and obviously there would be financial implications. Um, not knowing what the outcome of the nomination period is. Uh, with respect to the forthcoming uh, general election, I would also point out that uh, it may not be within the purview of this council to uh, add to the to the uh, the financial load of the municipality with respect to assumption, full assumption. Um, what I would suggest, if committee and council were so in, or committee was so inclined, would be to uh, refer the matter to staff. Staff will come back with a uh, with a report that will outline for you the implications of the uh, of the request. Um, you may choose to consider it or defer the matter to the next council to address. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, now, Councillor Bridgman, what do you think of that? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Zavitz. Um, I, I agree with Mr. Becking. I think it needs to go uh, to a report because this is just one road of many roads in our in our township that I believe it's seasonally, uh, it's, it's called a seasonal road. And we're back to that whole discussion of what's seasonal and what isn't. Uh, but I think, um, Director Becking, um, I, I agree with you. I don't see this being decided on before this winter, Mr. Coatsworth, I'll, I'll ask Mr. Becking, uh, but I think with the transportation study, it all rolls into that again. So I would be very comfortable having this uh, uh, staff report come back on this. And uh, in terms of reality, I, I, think, I think there's a preparation to have to do this perhaps one more year, Mr. Coatsworth. But if we can put it in the process to get it looked at, I'm hoping that that will be satisfactory for you. Okay, good, thank you. Councilor Ishikawa. Thank you. Um, I, I, along with what Barb was saying, the, um, I, I, 
some of my concerns because not many years ago, we turned down Tr Trafalgar Bay Road, uh, which is a close by road uh, off of Moon River Road um, with a lot of um, year round residents. So I just wanna make sure that um, we're looking at all of the past requests in, in just this area, I'm, I'm just saying specifically off of Moon River Road, I know more and more. Um, I, I just wish our population numbers were really true. I know people live up here year round. We don't acknowledge them, but they're there. Uh, and, and so I think we need to have a relook at a lot of these requests from the past and, and see how they are now affected today. Not. I don't want to just say that we're going to just deal with this particular road because, as I said, there were neighboring roads that had brought requests over the years. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And to that point, uh, Director Becking, do you have a, uh, a, a glossary of terms or a reference point for X number of roads that uh, maybe um, people have asked for like this over the years? that we could, uh, otherwise it's part of the transportation master plan in a more fulsome manner. And I won't ask you to uh, refer this to a staff report because, you know, <laughs> this is one of many roads. Um, you're, you're correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is one of many roads. Um, uh, I, I'm quite certain that I could put a handle on, on uh, what the broader implications are. Um, because we do know what which roads are are considered quote unquote seasonal, um, and uh, so um, I don't see it as being a, a terribly onerous task. That having been said, I think you've also alluded to uh, a very good point, which is that the TMP again part of the scope of of that work was to establish standards and and policies for committee and council's consideration. Um, and again, that, that study is scheduled to be completed uh, in the second quarter of, of next year. So um, uh, I think it's, it's entirely appropriate that the matter be referred and, uh, and it'll come back to the future council for, for their consideration. Okay, good. So given that, given that summary, um, again, in a referral scenario, but eyes on, um, is this committee uh, comfortable with where we sort of are with this in terms of this amongst the other roads and, and a, a referral to have a staff report uh, to that effect? Are we good with that? People are shaking their heads. Yes. Thumbs up. Councilor Roberts is good. Okay, I sense that we're good. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, David, thank you uh, for bringing this uh, to our attention. And I think you've heard today that it is um, going to be uh, attended to uh, and looked at and considered. And uh, you know, you're on the dance floor, as I like to say. So with that, we can talk separately if you'd like, but um, you know, stay tuned, there'll be more to hear on this, okay? Thank you for, thank you for coming forward at this topic, thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on now to item 4F. We have a, a Jim Bornhold uh, to attend at 1015 regarding a license agreement application, Mikolakchi uh, Tremaine. Yeah, so we probably should do that report first. So what we'll do is invite um, uh, Chriselle Story to, to talk to us about the license agreement application uh, rule 4-18-026. Chriselle. Thank you, Chair. The townships received a license agreement application for the encroachment of a driveway slash recreational court that is situated on a township road allowance. Staff have prepared a detailed report for committee's consideration. Staff are recommending that this application be defeated and the encroachment be removed from township land. Again, if there are any questions regarding process, our clerk or director Pink are available to answer or the property itself, director Becking. Thank you. Good, thank you, Chriselle. Okay, I'll invite uh, Jim Bornhold, uh, item 4F to attend. Um, is uh, Mr. Bornhold, uh, here, there, oh, there, okay. Does Mr. Bornhold have a presentation or was that a? There was Mr. Mr. Bornhold, welcome. Is your, your audio is not working. Can you hear me now? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I begin? Please do. We just get now we have a presentation. Here we go. Thank you. Will somebody from the township go through this as I instruct? Is that okay? Yes, you will. Sorry, go ahead. All right. Good morning. Through you, Mr. Chair, I would like to thank the Finance General Committee for allowing us to speak today. I would also like to thank the staff and some members of council for meeting and talking with us several times. I've owned a cottage in Muskoka for over 25 years and our current cottage for approximately 20 years. We love it. It's our home and we value being part of this community. I want to thank the staff for the report, <clears throat> pardon me, the report and recommendations they made and would like to explain why council should be supporting these recommendations. I am the property owner of the cottage located at 1107, number five, Bruce Lake Drive. Our property is located across the township's road from the applicants, Michalakili and Tremaine. I would like to point out that our neighbor's previous driveway was much smaller, flat and level with the township road, and we never had any water runoff, damage issues previously, nothing. Therefore, we never complained about it. There are three issues that we, we have with this. The first issue is the significant alteration of the grade. The grade has been raised considerably. You can see here in picture one, we've highlighted a curb on the right side and the framework around the footings of the new garage uh, addition that was made in a two-story. That curb is about six inches high. The board at the end by the garage, which starts at the top of the previous uh, parking area and ends at the floor of the, of the garage, is about 10 inches. Therefore, we've seen a great change of between six to 10 inches through the new driveway that's been installed. Our neighbor has also installed packed gravel. If you go to the next picture, um, actually I'll step here. This is when the old one stopped. We also highlight again, the height of the being about six inches. Let's go to picture three. Picture three here on the right side, although not completely clear, comes out about 10 feet from, from the original driveway and about 12 to 15 feet on the other side. As a result of the altered grade, this forces water onto our property from the neighbor's driveway in Township Road, because in addition to this, they have done a packed gravel and fill at the edge of the driveway, which ends on the Township Road. And that grading carries out almost through to our, our, uh, our property. If you go to the next slide, you will see the grade. It's a little hard to pick it up because of the shadow, but there is a grading and you can see our bear box. It comes across almost all the way across the, the property. That altered grade forces water onto our property from the drive, neighbor's driveway and township road. The second issue is the creation of a slope. If we can go to slide five, the slope created through altering grade has caused considerable water runoff, even in light rainfalls. During the week of July 25th, 2022, during a light rainfall, substantial trenches were created in our driveway. You can see this in pages, pictures five, sorry, six. Go to the next one, please. Here we've had our landscaper take a picture of this. Uh, six, seven, where you will see me with my hand and I'm straddling something that's around eight to 10, maybe even 12 inches wide at some places. Uh, we have two trenches. This is the key one. There's a smaller one as well, going about 16 to 22 feet down our driveway, which you can see in the next picture. Furthermore, gravel and debris were carried down to the parking area across our front yard and across our stairs and front entrance landing, creating damage and a safety concern. In the next picture that you go to, I believe has here we go as an example of some of the mud that, that, that uh, was there. If you go to the next picture, you'll see more. Another one here where you can see it's come across a number of the stairs. This uh, Additionally, we installed mulch last year, which was completely washed away. Plantings were covered in mud and gravel. And I stress again, a light rainfall. The third issue we have is the drainage. In extending his driveway further by approximately 10 feet on the right side of the curb. If we went back to the third picture, uh, he 10 feet on the left, right side of the curb. On the opposite side, it's about 12 to 15 feet. The neighbor has altered the drainage significantly, which has already caused damage to our property as a result of the increased rain, rainwater flow and velocity being directed to our property, which is evidenced by the, the pictures I've shown. And I'm not sure if council had a chance to see the two videos that we also sent prior to this meeting. 
They exemplified the damage being done. The extended dry and widened driveway also increased the impermeable area of the drive, uh, which uh, of the area, which prevents water from being absorbed into what was previously the township gravel dirt road and is now directed to our property, causing damage. The water runoff is of even a further concern in the winter when dealing with melting snow, rain, and refreezing, and what this will do and create in our driveway and front entrance. Hey, to summarize, got your five minutes. Go ahead with your summary. Quickly. To summarize, we have already experienced significant damage to our property due to increased runoff flow and velocity as a result of the extension grade alteration by our neighbor when he paved his new driveway after being told not to do so by the township, as well as the packed gravel. We would like to minimize future damages and safety concerns. I, uh, I would like to ask council to move forward and support the staff recommendations to deny the license agreement between Mikalaki and Tremaine and that the encroachment of the driveway and rec recreational court be removed as soon as possible to limit the damages occurring to our property. If anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir, for your time. Okay, and your, your quality presentation. I will um, look to Melissa Markham, um, who is uh, speaking to to this, is she here? Yes. Okay, and as, as I would understand, would Melissa be their representative for these people? Yes. Oh, for the applicant? Okay, so we're gonna let uh, Melissa come on first, and then we'll let uh, Rob Michalaki and Lisa Tremaine, uh, who are also here with us, uh, speak to this. So welcome, Melissa. Is your audio on? Good morning, committee. Can you hear me? You can. Thank you. Go Perfect. ahead. Perfect. Thank you very much. So good morning, Mr. Chair, committee, and staff. My name is Melissa Markham, Marie Pori Planning and Associates, 44 King William Street, Unit A, Huntsville, Ontario, P1H1G3. So today I'm acting as the agent on behalf of the property owners, and I've read the staff report attached to today's agenda, and I'd like to provide a brief overview of the application and a response to the comments in the staff report. Next slide, please. So the applicants have applied for a license agreement in order to enable a portion of their driveway, which is paved, to remain on the road allowance. The staff report also identified a recreational court, which is only line painting on the existing driveway. As you heard from the previous son of the neighbor, the owners purchased the property in 2016 and there was an existing gravel driveway. They paved this driveway in 2017. And in 2022, the owners constructed a garage on the property. They repaved the existing driveway. The only change that the owners have mentioned is about two inches towards the garage. So it was raised two inches at the garage and uh, is still level with the existing road at the end of the driveway. Um, other than adding a couple of feet to the end, so there'd be about three feet, which was added to try and divert water to the side and not to the front of the driveway, there was no change other than this to the width of the driveway. The owners spoke with their neighbors in the fall of 2021 and in the spring prior to paving, and no issues were raised in these conversations prior to proceeding with the repaving. And once again, the driveway was paved in 2017, and in the past five years, no complaints have been made by either the municipality or the surrounding neighbors. Next slide, please. So the owners uh, are shown on this plan as lot 17, part one, two, and three. Part three was part of an original road allowance closed by the township in 2016 by bylaw. The blue area you see here on your screen depicts the approximate area where the driveway is located on the road allowance. As you can see in the aerial photo, the lands owned by the applicants is maintained in a very natural state. The driveway is cleared. Uh, it's the only main area on that property that's cleared. So the owners use this for outdoor activities with their family for basket, uh, basketball, pickleball, without the need to clear any additional land on, uh, in this area. Next slide, please. So here are a few photos taken of the encroachment, which is the paved driveway. So on the left, you see the paved driveway. There is a basketball net, which is actually located on the owner's property. Uh, for your reference, the garage shown in the photo is 7.8 meters, so about 25 and a half feet set back from the property line. So that's where the road allowance would begin. As you can see, the topography of the lands uh, is such that the garage shown on the left is slightly higher than the road. And I think you heard that from the neighbor who just spoke. Next slide, please. So when reviewing the staff report, the following items were raised as concerns. The grade has been altered, length has been increased, increased to stormwater runoff velocity, increased stormwater flow, potential impact on abutting properties, and potential for township plow damage during uh, winter operations. So I'm just gonna keep some of these slides up as I'm talking about those points. So we wanna make the following four points. Number one, the grade has not been altered other than to divert any runoff to the side of the driveway. As I mentioned, the owner stated the driveway was increased two to three inches um, after the construction of the garage. Number two, the length of the driveway has been increased 
three feet uh, to connect with the traveled roads. And in number three, with regards to the response to stormwater runoff and the impacts to neighbor, oh, I had a stormwater management engineer review the property and conduct a site visit for their opinion. As you recall, there was a rain event on Monday, just this past Monday. The engineer attended the property during this time to ascertain any impacts. The engineer provided the following comments. The driveway sloped towards the road, and the road is sloped towards the neighboring property across the road. Approximately 25% of the water flowing onto the abutting property is from the subject driveway. 75% of the water is actually from the road itself. And you heard the neighbor mention that in their, in their presentation, that portion of this comes from the road. It's their opinion that if the paved portion of the driveway was removed and replaced with crushed granite, it's his opinion that there'd be no difference in the storm water onto the road or abutting property. Water is not infiltrating into the road any more than it is into the paved driveway. We've also received a letter from Duke Engineering with regards to the increase in length. As the neighbor mentioned, um, these impacts have only occurred since the existing driveway from 2017 uh, was lengthened an additional three feet. I'm gonna try and be quick in this, but our, the analysis from Duke Engineering showed that by paving this additional area, it increased the flow from about uh, to about 400 milliliters or less than two cups of water per second during a 10 year storm event. Uh, 24 hours st uh, required storage for this increase in water would be about 11 liters or roughly um, half of a typical Home Depot bucket. So as um, part of this, it's, it's identified that those three feet is not really having, it's having a negligible impact on the uh, change on the property. The stormwater, in our opinion, can be mitigated by a depression at the end of the paved driveway to drain the runoff further down the road and into the woods. There's also a suggestion from the engineer that uh, ditches would also assist in the municipality to help with that. As for the snowplow, there's been no concerns raised to date. I know that I'm at my five minutes at this point. Uh, I did have a couple more slides with regards to the merits of the application, but I believed in terms of my summary, I have covered over what uh, staff have raised as their concerns. And I am here and also the owner is here to identify any questions or answer anything that uh, committee should have for us today. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before I invite uh, Rob and Lisa to come on, um, I, just a question to you. Did your expert, noted expert, um, have any opinion as to where all the water that we've just seen visu visually uh, on the other presentation, where that water is coming from, as, as if this is new water. So, and it's a surprise to them. So I, I guess in, the, in terms of the boreholes, where do you think, or where did your expert think that water was coming from? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So the expert that we had go out to the property on Monday, as I said, it was during a storm event and did look that the majority of the water, it, it's difficult. I'm not sure if any of the committee members have been out to the property, but the road does slope towards that driveway that the owner has. So they had shown some depression in their driveway. I would say um, the majority of the water is, is running across the property and from the road itself and down into this little depression. There is no ditches on this road. So all of the water that's being contained on the road road. It's a very hard packed surface. It's, it's impervious. There's no water getting through in his opinion and all of it's collecting. And essentially it's all running down the, uh, the driveway of the, the neighbor who just spoke. Uh, we believe there's mitigation measures that can um, affect this. There's actually a property owner at the end of the road. He's actually the brother of our, uh, the owner, and he also has grading issues with his, but he's always had that on his property. It, it's not with regards to this. Uh, there's always been drainage issues on this portion of the road due to the runoff from um, the way that the road slopes. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, any, okay, committee good? Listen, I'm going to ask. Yeah, yeah, right. So I'm going to invite Lisa uh, Tremaine, I believe she's here with us, to uh, provide comment. Then the committee. Lisa, welcome. Oh, there they are. Both of you are here. Welcome. You've got your, your uh, video on. Can you turn that? Oh, hi, sorry. We're, we're just trying to uh, bring this up at our end here. Hey, okay, you're good. I see you and okay. hear you. Okay, sure. And this is, it's Rob McLashie here with my wife, uh, Lisa. Um, I'll just speak briefly. Oh, there, sorry. Uh, I just want to summarize our, our position and uh, propose um, what we think is a, a really good solution here. Hi, sir. We're, we're just trying to. Uh, what else we got in the background? There's something else on a computer. Okay, sure. I think it's the webcast again. 
Nikolaski, yeah. if you could turn off the webcast and just listen to the computer screen. Hello there. Sorry. Uh, I just want to summarize our, our position. There you go. Okay, are, are we? Go are ahead. We Great, thank you. Yes, worried about that. Yeah, so I just want to summarize our position and, and then propose what we think is a win-win solution here. Um, I'll start really quickly with the issue of the snow plow. Uh, we, we really think that's a, a non-issue. These snow plows have equipment in place that, that buffers any you know, transition between uh, gravel and, and pavement. Um, I can tell you, I took pictures the other day when the snow plow comes on and off Bruce Lake Drive from the paved peninsula road, it, it deals with far worse than it, it deals with, you know, at our property line. Uh, we've had five years of the snow plow, um, you know, managing uh, the road without any problems. So we, we think the snow plow really is, is not an issue uh, at all. I, I think the real issue here that, that uh, we're all talking about uh, is, is the issue of, of drainage. And we don't dispute that Jim has a, a drainage issue on his property. Um, now, I think in, in the work that we've had done by a, a third party storm drainage expert and an engineering firm, I, I think we've objectively and, and convincingly made the point that the pavement on, our, on the municipal road is not the cause uh, of the drainage issues for our neighbor. Uh, now, that being said, and, and sorry, and, and maybe more importantly than that, I, I think the, the critical point is removing that portion of the driveway that is on the municipal road is not going to provide any relief for Jim. Um, now, with all that in mind, and in the spirit of being a good neighbor and in the spirit of being a good Muskokan citizen, um, we're willing to, to take care of the, of the problem at our expense. We're willing to have somebody come out, identify what could be done. And Melissa spoke to a couple of things. We, we will pay to mitigate the issue so that, that Jim doesn't have to deal with any drainage issues on his property. So I, I think we have two possible outcomes here. One is a lose-lose, uh, where we are asked to tear up that portion of our driveway that is, is on the, the access road. Uh, and we certainly lose because we, we don't have a, a pickleball court or a basketball court that, that we can use, and our kids um, you know, lose out in, in these activities. But Jim also loses because it's, it's been made clear that the removal of that portion of the driveway isn't going to solve anything for him. Uh, now, I think the win-win is that we keep it in place and that we work to mitigate the issue on Jim's property. Uh, and, and I think that's a, a fantastic outcome. I, I think, and I hope that, that council sees the wisdom in, in finding a solution here that, that provides the right outcome for, you know, two of, of, Muskoka's, uh, of Muskoka's citizens. And I'd be really curious to hear what, what Jim would have to say about that. We haven't had much of a chance to talk to him since, uh, since this became an issue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, um, Jim, I might, before I ask the committee, I might give you an, an opportunity to uh, respond, although I understand you're probably just, perhaps just hearing this for the first time in terms of an offer from an olive branch from your neighbor. Is that uh, something you might entertain? No, it's not. I, I would like to make a point here. If you take a look at our pictures, that they've outright misrepresented this. We were, they mentioned, Rob mentioned this to us, that they were going to go out a couple of feet. They did not go out a couple of feet, and we weren't happy about that at the time. They did not go out a couple of feet. You can, uh, Director Becking has been out. You can take from the edge of where the old driveway ended at the end of the curb and go and take a tape measure. It's about 10 feet out. It's not, a, of not three feet, as Melissa Markham represented, nor did it raise two or three inches. You can clearly see the curb was at least six inches and the footing for the foundation was at least 10 inches. I'm not sure where you get a raise of two to three inches when both of those were above the pre-existing driveway. So you have a minimum of about 10 inches and I'll even be generous, eight inches for, uh, for the foundation piece at the edge of their, their garage. And it is significantly increased throughout uh, at least six inches. So there is, a, there is a difference in grade. As far as the engineer is concerned and lack of complaint, we didn't have a water runoff issue until after this new paving was done, which was done after 
the township was clear and told the Michalakis, as well as their foreman, not to do it. And Rob then went and told the foreman, go ahead, do what I want. Okay. I can't see how council can award bad behavior after what somebody's done when he was told not to do it. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not happy with when he talks about here's here's a solution. Okay. We we're, we're in uncharted territory now. So I, I you know we've given you uh, ample opportunity. Actually, both of you. So now we're going to go into a committee setting and uh, discuss this. So thank you both for your uh, your time and your presence here today and your content. Uh, I'm going to ask the mayor to start off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess my specific question would be to uh, Director Becking. Um, to, to dumb things down, it would appear to me that in paving the driveway and paving our road allowance, that the grade of the road has been altered. And if that is the case, then we need to rectify that. Whether it's one inch or two inches or seven inches, if in paving the road or paving this driveway out onto a road allowance has altered the grade, that's what we need to do more than anything else. And my gut feeling is looking at the before and after photos is that it has been uh, increased, especially out to sort of create a level um, court that also slopes away from the garage. So Director Becky maybe can help with what's been done. So Director Becky, could you speak to that? You were our eyes and uh, ears on scene. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would would agree that there has been a, a grade raise of, of the uh, area. There has been an increase in the area of asphalt surface that has also been uh, created um, in to, to put it in, in a sort of lay person's perm, uh, terms. Um, the runoff from a paved surface compared to the runoff from a gravel surface is about a two and a half times factor. In other words, two and a half times more of the fallen rain runs off asphalt than it does off of gravel. Um, and there's a whole host of technical reasons for that, but uh, suffice to say that, that uh, the factor that you need to consider is two and a half times. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Mayor Hardy, you good with that? Okay, good, thanks, thumbs up. Okay, Councillor Bridgman and then Councillor Nishikawa. Uh, thank you, Chair Zavitz. I have been to the property and I was there after what was not a very hard rain and I could see the runoff from, from this driveway right through to the newborn's place. There is no question that that's happened, but I have, um, I mean, I have some other issues. It, the, you know, we're going to remove it, and and I'm there, and I can see they've actually paved onto the road, not our road allowance, but onto the road, and um, and so I cannot support any of this. Our road allowance needs to be put back right through to the back of our road allowance, put back to normal. But my next question, and I don't know if you can answer it, uh, Director Becking, I don't think that Mr. Kennedy is still here now. He's off at court. But to know that a contractor was told you cannot do this, it's against the bylaws, consults with the owner and then goes ahead to do it. Are we not finding, are we not finding the contractor for this? I mean, this is the stuff we're dealing with in planning a lot now. And so I would like an assurance that that, that the contractor is going to also be fined for uh, for what has been done here. So that, and then I then I have a follow up if you don't mind. I wonder if we ask David Pink to, yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so David, uh, would you speak to that? Uh, thank you, uh, through you. Uh, as the committee will recall, uh, council did pass a policy for the bylaw enforcement division. Uh, and in that policy, the discretion rests with the bylaw enforcement officer as to the tools available to them and the steps they take. Uh, laying charges is an option, uh, and I believe it still can be contemplated. Uh, my understanding in speaking with Mr. Kennedy is that uh, we're not aware of the contractor in question uh, who did the work. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, uh, further investigations have occurred and that information has been determined, um, but I believe that's the current state. Uh, so charges are a possibility. Uh, it's at the discretion uh, of the bylaw officer, and I think we've allowed this process to 
uh, play out to determine council's position uh, on the matter first to see if the municipality will take any further steps. I hope that helps uh, clarify. I think it does. Thank you. One more, Councillor Savitz, if you don't mind. Okay, so, I mean, I, 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 I think if we know who it is, we have to start implementing fines. Um, the second part is because there is a lot of damage being done here. It's very obvious from the, from the pictures. Um, I know the motion says within 21 days of council passing this, which would be next month. Um, do we then hire a contractor? I'm just asking process now. Do we hire somebody to come back in and put this if this passes or if we deny this? Um, do we hire someone or does public works actually go out and do it? I'm I'm just looking for information now from Mr. Becking. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we could do it either way is the short answer. Okay. Okay. Councillor Nishikawa and then Councillor Edwards. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a few, few things come to my mind. And, and in fact, I've always been against um, paving and, and some of our, I, this council hasn't discussed it, but past councils have discussed, um, for instance, we're not recommending paving on a lot of even our commercial establishments. And even if I was to look at uh, a couple that happened in, in the Port Car Carling area, uh, during the last council, they, they took our recommendation as, as a pervious um, driveway as opposed to, and in fact, we even had a CEO that, who was the director of public works uh, for Bracebridge. And he was actually uh, turning a lot of the paved roads into uh, gravel roads for lots of different reasons. But so I, I know that this is going to be a problem. I, I, I unfortunately could not believe some of the information that I was hearing from um, the consultants um, from Marie Poy's office, uh, because that is just not the reality that I see, I've seen on, on um, a lot of years of um, experience. I, I'm not sure if the property owners are aware that if I wanted to go and play on that driveway, because that's a public access, that's a, that's a public road, public access. We could go do that today or other members of the public. Um, and so that's, that's a bit of a concern because again, um, we're not, anyhow, I, I really have to agree with the report from uh, Director Becking that, and in fact, we should support that report. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, last word from uh, Councillor Edwards and then we'll move on with this. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I cannot support this, it should be removed, but also when our bylaw officer are out on site and there's a contractor working, they should get their, their, uh, their company name, the license numbers of, of, of the truck and everything to go after them as well. And that when they were told not to, to do it and they, they went ahead and uh, paved, uh, I'm sure that maybe uh, the other property owner can provide the company's name to uh, to, to bylaw, but uh, when they disregard a, a, an order, I think they should be charged as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, okay, Councillor Jagwitz, then I'll call the vote. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, allowing, uh, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm going to make the same uh, recommendation that I did at the last uh, the last. Uh, Thing that came in front of us. I, I, I hear two sides to this story. Um, I'm going to recommend that this be deferred. And the reason for the deferral is to allow both parties to review each other's information. It's my understanding that the presentation that Mr. Bernhold uh, made was just published in a supplementary agenda. And I don't believe it was made available to the applicant or their agent in order for them to adequately respond to it. it in the same regard, the applicant's agent came forward with two uh, consultants, as they were called. They both expressed opinions, but they were they were not in written form. And, and they came at the last opportunity, which I'm sure the, uh, the neighbor was not allowed to review. So I think in, in fairness, it would be well if there was a deferral to allow the parties to exchange that information and working with staff to see if in fact, 
uh, there might be some solution here. Um, uh, I, the other thing I just have to add, and, and you know, I really didn't want to bring this up, but when I, when I found out that, that, that they had paved on a road allowance to the traveled portion of the road, I wondered if that was okay. So I, I took a little tour uh, this weekend and I actually visited um, several properties. And, and um, the first one I visited was Cedar Rail where I found four properties had paved to the, to the road, 1026, 1076, 1080, and 1090. Then I went to Bailey Street and I found at least two properties that were paved to the road. In other words, there's the road, there's the sidewalk, there's the driveway paved, and in between the two, which is a road allowance, was paved. Then I went to Stevens Road. I found 1177 and 1200 had done the same. Then I went to Island Park Road, and I found that 1076 and 1083 had done the same. Then I thought, well, what the heck, I'll go to Marinas Road, which is way out of the way. And lo and behold, two properties there, 1212 and 1231 had paved to the road. So this is not an uncommon occurrence. And I, I just think that a deferral would be in order to allow some more discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Kelly, I will give you the last word. Thank you. Uh, and I have to ask, I'm assuming on Bailey Street, we're looking at number five, six, and eight, and two of the offenders were those <laughs> properties. I just want to say uh, on this particular issue, I want, I want to pick up on one thing. I think there's a real urgency here. Uh, you know, the pictures don't lie. Uh, we can see evidence of damage slash destruction. And if it's not destruction now, it's destruction waiting to be uh, waiting to happen. I think a 21 day delay is is has got to be bridged down to something shorter. And, and I think to pick up a little bit on on uh, what Councillor uh, Bridgman had alluded to, to the extent that we can get involved and get it done faster. I, I just don't think we can afford to let this sit uh, at the risk of Mr. Bornhold's property. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so, Jimmy, you have your hand up. I, I'm sorry, but we're, we're sort of done that whole process now. So um, um, I won't allow any more commentary. I, I have a motion here. Um, I'm going to call a vote. Uh, sorry? Oh, sorry, Mayor Hardy, you have your hand up. Sorry, thank you. Um, uh, interesting uh, question from a uh, uh, immediacy of this, and, and I understand is there a way, um, you know, we pass this today, uh, it gets ratified um, in September, but is there a, a way that any damage, any erosion that does occur between now and September can be remediated or monitored? I, I go to Director Becking on that to ensure that there's nothing further that happens, um, you know, and, and uh, just looking for better understanding on that. And Mayor, to that end, prior to Director Becking, um, it is possible to vote uh, if it passes this morning uh, to do the two thirds and, and get it right to council this afternoon. I mean, that would deal with the urgency issue, the time sensitive aspect to it, would it not? Okay, yeah, good. So I think that is a likelihood, but again, I'm not gonna presuppose how this vote will go. So uh, let's do that first. Um, I would uh, I would state uh, today, August 10, 22, moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Roberts, be resolved that license agreement application uh, number LA0922 Michalachi uh, Tremaine be denied, and that the encroachment of a driveway recreational court situated on a township road allowance known as Bruce Lake Drive, Lion King Concession 12, Lot 25 Medora be removed, and that the township road allowance be restored at no cost to the township, no later than 21 days after council ratification of general and finance committee's recommendation. Uh, I'll ask all those in favor. Okay, I've called the vote. So we have, okay, all those opposed? That's carried, thank you. And then I would ask again for this app to bring this to council this afternoon. Lauren, perhaps you could help me with that. We just need a first and second or two 
bring it to council this afternoon? That's a two-thirds motion. Yeah, so we need a two-thirds motion of support to bring this to uh, council this afternoon, given the urgency piece to that, as we've discussed. Uh, are we, uh, do we have enough of that support? We have two-thirds uh, support to bring it to council this afternoon. I do see that there's a couple of hands up. So, Council Bridgman? Um, could I ask if Mr. Um, you, um, Bornhold would like that to happen? I think as the owner of that other property, that is a good question. My other question is, is that bypassing any process if we do that? Can we base that on urgency? Because I do agree with Mayor Harding, more damage is going to be done here. There's no question about it. So, um, and so maybe our clerk can let us know. That's that becomes a, a a good reason to expedite this. So maybe I'll ask Lauren that. Well, sure, Lauren, go ahead. I'm not going to speak to the incurring liability piece, but on the procedural piece, you know that your um, procedural bylaw allows council to walk things on to council with a certain motion. Your general process has been to allow 30 days uh, for it to come to council. So there is a mechanism by which to circumvent those 30 days, but uh, whether it's tested in any forum, I can't say that it has. Okay, thank you. Councilor Bridgman, you have a secondary? Well, um, no, I mean, if, if everybody here wants it, to go, I am certainly on board with that. So, uh, Councillor Nishikawa, I, I, I would, I would be happy to put that motion in place if, if that's what all the councillors want. Councillor Nishikawa, is that something? Go ahead. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Who am I talking? Like, so I thought I was go put ahead. my hand up to discuss something. You do. You have the floor. Go ahead. So I, I am challenged with trying to move this forward this afternoon. I think that we are uh, pushing our luck, if you want to call it that. Um, you know, as much as I would like this to be fixed and repaired, and I'm concerned about the neighboring property owner, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, and I do believe that we should um, follow our, our municipal processes. I am um, wondering, though, uh, Director Becking, if in the meantime, um, if there is an opportunity to either, um, I don't know, create a berm, French drain, I don't, you know, you're the guy that knows how to do this sort of stuff, but essentially try to mitigate the damages that are happening on the neighboring property until this comes um, uh, to council. Okay, I'm going to let the mayor speak and uh, Councillor Edwards. Sorry, could I hear from Director Becking if that's a possibility? Sorry, Director Becking, to your expertise. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, we can certainly look at, at the situation and see if there's any mitigating strategies. That having been said, uh, the law of drainage is, is a civil matter. Um, council or committee should be aware, however, that while the origin of the problem may be partly on, on one side of the, the property or the road allowance and, and the damages on the other, uh, the township is the, the party in the middle. And uh, so we would be uh, at least aiding and abetting any damages that might be occurring. Okay, thank you, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. You know, one of the reasons we bring things, I think, first of all, to uh, committee first and then to council is to give us a pause, potentially. Uh, the applicant in this case um, may have different information. Uh, the neighbor's information has just been provided. Um, there's no question there's uh, potentially some damage uh, that the vote, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, Madam Clerk, to consider the item this afternoon would actually be at the start of council this afternoon versus done in this particular forum. But um, I, I would like to give a pause to this and I'm guess specifically um, to affect a pause. Uh, and, and I'm not sure, you know, if, if we can mitigate damages from director Becking's perspective and, or if the applicant themselves would voluntarily say if damage is done, and this is 
to be removed that they would actually contribute to help fix any damage that's done. Uh, I certainly am okay with pausing this for 30 days. And I, I'm going to assume that the applicant to have that 30 day pause would certainly be amenable to that because they're saying no damage is happening. So they should easily be allowed to say, I'm okay to repair any damage if this continues to cause damage. So uh, I'm, I'm looking towards a, I think a 30 day and bring this to council in September. Well, I can see you've still got your, okay, yeah, see, we're gonna get into this discussion. We'll be here for an hour. I Listen, I'm gonna let uh, Councillor Ed, uh, Edwards have a last word and then we're going to uh, move on. Uh, I would be in favor of bringing it forward this afternoon because if we wait 30 days and then there's 21 days, that's 51 days, 51 days of, of, of uh, damage and that's civil. And that's so that uh, I think we should bring it forward today. I would uh, second uh, Councillor Bridgman on that or move it if nobody else wants to. Uh, okay, do we need a seconder here now? Is it this afternoon? This afternoon, we need a first, a seconder, and two-thirds vote to move Right, forward. so this afternoon at Council, we would need a first, a seconder, and a two-thirds motion to uh, to get this on the uh, agenda for this afternoon. And that would be done this afternoon uh, when Council were to start. So we're essentially done with this issue here and now as we've read the vote and we've, we've now got this, this piece done. So um, I, there is nothing else to say in terms of uh, where we've uh, where we've come. Right, right. So if you if, if you do want to first and second this motion uh, this, for this afternoon's activity, then you would need to let uh, uh, our clerk, uh, Lauren Tarasik, know uh, over the lunch hour. OK, we don't do it now. We do it then. OK, thank you. And thank you for both uh, both parties for attending. Uh, you you at least now have a an outcome, and um, I suppose you know check in this afternoon uh, to see how that uh, how that, uh, that 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 happens. So, so thank you for your time. Thanks for being here. Okay, item six uh, C. I believe that's the end of all of our delegations. We have no one else in the waiting room, so we're good with that. Item six C is a report from. Uh, our Director of Financial Services, Mark Donaldson, regarding Q2 financial update. Mark, you've got, you're welcome. You've got the floor. Thank you, Chair Zavitz, and uh, greetings, committee members. As per the Township's policy, attached is a financial update for the second quarter of June 30th, uh, at June 30th for the Township. Uh, results uh, to date are, com are compared to the full year approved budget for both operating and capital expenditures. Uh, table one which is on page 30 of your agenda package, shows the results to June 30th by category or by type of expense and revenue. Uh, it's noted in the report, expenses uh, to June 30th are 50% utilized, excluding transfers to reserves, uh, while revenues are 87% realized. Uh, but I would note that $1.2 million of federal and provincial grants received to date that will be used for capital are included in this report and were not part of the original operating budget. So if that is adjusted and we exclude these grants, revenues to June 30th are actually 60% realized. So we have 40% of the budget remaining for, uh, for the rest of the year. General explanations of variances for both expenses and revenues are included in the report against the approved 2022 budget and the prior year. Um, table two, which is on page 34 of your agenda package, presents the same information, but just structured differently on a net basis by operating division. So by net basis, meaning expenses, net of any revenues attributed to that particular division, as well, general explanations of variances for larger uh, differences are also included uh, against the operating approved operating budget. Uh, just on capital expenditures, table three shows a summary of the capital spending by division against the amended 2022 capital budget. The number of approved, uh, there has been a number of approved projects that have commenced so far in this year, but have not yet been reported. We don't have any costs or uh, invoices received, so they're not reflected yet. Uh, they will be reflected as the year goes on. Uh, as outlined in the report, um, of the $2.1 million that is being reported at Q2, 
there's just a little over 900,000 that relates to expenditures that are carryovers from projects that were approved last year. Um, so these amounts, while recognized in 2022, will be paid from the reserves that were approved the, and drawn from reserves that were approved last year. Uh, staff continue to work with our uh, software vendors to be able to generate a more detailed project level life to date reporting that covers multiple fiscal years so we can see the whole life of a project from start to, start to end and we'll include those uh, more detailed reports in future quarterly updates. Uh, just a quick word on actual contributions to reserves so they are much higher than planned and again that relates to the grants I mentioned earlier um, that have been transferred to uh, reserves for capital so that uh, is just a flow through, comes in on the revenue, goes out through the transfers to reserves. Just for committee's information, uh, we've received 50% of our Ontario Municipal Partnership funding this year so far, 50% of our Ontario Community Infrastructure Fund. We've received some money from the Municipal Modernization Funding Programs, uh, FedNOR grants, some rural economic development grants as well, and our Summer Experience Funding. Contributions to reserves, relate to approved draws uh, for election related expenses that were in the budget. So in all, the municipality continues to manage within its budget. Uh, we're doing well to Q2, but inflation pressures continue to be something of a concern that we're watching very closely. Uh, we'll continue to manage expenses within approved estimates of council uh, and to monitor appropriately. And with that, I'm pleased to take any questions from the committee. Okay, well, thank you for that report. Very enlightening. Uh, there we go, Councillor Jagwitz, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Director, for that, uh, that, that important report. And also thank you for bringing these uh, uh, results to us uh, so quickly after the end of the second quarter. It's a great improvement. Uh, I have a question. You indicate that overall, when you take expenditures and revenue together, we have 52% of our budget left. But when you just look at expenditures, we only have 42% left. Um, are you confident, uh, which means we spent 58, are you confident that we can uh, follow through the next six months with only 42% of the budget on the expenditure side? Or are you predicting an over expenditure? Thank you, I'm just, I'm just getting, thank you, I'm just getting yep. to the table. So uh, thank you through you, Chair. So the 42% that is being referenced is uh, after transfers to reserves and transfers to reserves are higher than they would be at the midpoint of the year because of the grants that uh, were received through revenue and then being transferred out. So uh, I'm looking more at before transfers to reserves because that's certainly transfers to reserves at the end of the year. If we take out the grants piece will be exactly what was approved by committee and council through the budget. It'll, it'll be exactly what we approved through the levy. So at 50% before transfers to reserves, I think we're, we're right on target at Q2. And I don't have any concerns other than inflationary pressures that we're going to have to uh, deal with with regard to supplies and, and uh, consumables that we have. Um, we'll continue to manage those closely, but I, I feel confident that we will, we will continue to manage our expenses within the budget allocation. Good, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and and uh, as I take from that, you're, you're predicting we'll either have a balanced budget or a surplus. So, so thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. I see no other uh, questions or comments. Uh, Mark, good report, great report, uh, good status. Um, thank you for that. This is for information only. You've got your, yes, sir, go ahead. You have a comment? Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add one additional comment in addition to the report, so not related to the Q2 report directly, but I did want to make committee aware that uh, staff intend to launch our public engagement site for uh, input on the 2023 budget. So that's part of our commitment to public engagement. Um, I, I, did, uh, I did want to just make uh, committee members aware. It's a, it'll just be a similar to what we did last year with our Engage Muskoka Lakes um, site, just to, to uh, solicit uh, input and comments and feedback from the public as we go through preparing for getting ready for the 2023 budget. So I just wanted to make that uh, information available to members today. 
Thank you. And that would be one of the new council's first uh, mandates, correct? To, to start on a budget process. Correct, Chair. The, the Municipal Act requires that in the year of election, the, the new council would approve it in the year that uh, it pertains to. So okay. in 2023. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other comments. So uh, well, thank you for your attendance and your time today. Um, I'm going to move on now to item 7A, which is our fire chief, uh, Ryan Morell, uh, regarding fire route, his fire route bylaw for report status. Uh, Chief Morell. Welcome. There he is. Welcome. Thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. I was a little distracted. It's a little delayed in here. Um, what's before you, Chair and Committee, is a report that highlights the overview of a fire route bylaw. This is a draft. Uh, this bylaw would designate certain private and public roadways in the township as fire routes. This is the first fire route bylaw for the township. Uh, this is defined in the Fire Protection and Prevention Act. It's also defined as an access route in the building code. Um, for some reference for council, when a building is built, a certain type of building like a museum or a grocery store or a large industrial building or any building over 600 meters squared with uh, two over three stories must have a fire access route. In the past, these routes have been identified to the fire department, but they have never been signed properly. And that is partially because we do not have a fire route bylaw. Uh, what a fire route does for the fire department is allows us to get close enough to a structure on three sides, uh, what we would call reasonable distances for our hoses to reach both the hydrant, the accessible uh, sprinkler connections, and our fire truck. Um, if you could imagine the food land, for example, is a good example in Port Carly, that hydrant that exists at the property is actually on private property and the roadway that uh, accesses that whole area is a private roadway. This fire route bylaw would have the effect of allowing that roadway to be maintained clear. Uh, this will be a living document. I know that some councillors have asked me the question whether or not we could add other buildings to the fire route bylaw as they are constructed, that would be the case. This would provide for uniform signage and it would allow staff to remove vehicles that are parked within the fire route. Um, as it is today, there is no method to apply any enforcement other than to the owner of the building. Uh, so we could not apply any enforcement to people that park within the fire route. This fire route bylaw would allow for that. I now stand for questions. Okay, Mayor has his hand up. Go ahead, Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you, Chief Morrell. Obviously, we want safer buildings. Um, I'll turn your attention or committee's attention to page 51 um, of our agenda package, which uh, refers to, I believe, Walker's Point Marina and uh, the fire route there. The question when we talk about no parking, uh, there are designated parking spots on either side of that fire route. Are we anticipating that those would be removed or it's just the roadway must remain open? Because uh, we're gonna have a problem on a lot of these if we have to remove some of these on side of the road parking or side of the fire road parking. So um, excellent question through you chair to the committee. That uh, fire road that you see before you is already a defined fire road. So as it stands right now, I could get in my truck head out to that property and apply a fire code offense charge to the owner of the property. By signing it and properly allowing it to be a designated fire route, we could deal with each of those vehicles that are parked within the route today independently. Okay, so supplemental because I guess I'm not understanding. Are you suggesting that again on that Walker's Point Marina Road, we will be removing all on-site parking. I think that's probably an easier way to say it in this particular case, because there is parking on the left and right-hand side of the road uh, or of that fire route as you enter the marina. Are we going to be demanding that parking be removed? So already that exists in fire code that ve those vehicles should not be there in fire code. What we're asking council to do is designate this as a fire route so that we can now apply enforcement to each of the parties that are parked within the fire route. Already existing in law, that is an access route defined in law. 
because there is a hydrant on the opposite side of the fire rope where you see it terminates at the very end, there's actually a fire hydrant there. That is for servicing that building. So to your question, really what council's doing is allowing for a uniform version of a sign to be applied and for uniform enforcement to be applied to each of the parties that are parked within that fire rope. Mm -hmm. Okay, so good. thank you for that. So to, to the mayor's point and to your rebuttal, uh, and uh, our bylaw enforcement officer is not here. David, could you speak to, is this going to be perceived as a, any type of change of level of park, parking service, if you will, uh, availability of, of, of uh, public road parking uh, that the mayor, I believe the mayor that's trying to, that's the point you're trying to make. Go ahead. Well, if, if I'm not sure if the chief wants to handle this again, I'll go to food land in Port Curling based on the fire route, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, probably 30 or 40 parking spots that are on the ground, painted lines, potentially will no longer be parking spots anymore, um, which also might put the building out of compliance for offering an appropriate number of parking spots. Uh, and are we ticketing cars? Um, I, I just, I struggle with some of this we're taking away staff parking at Muskoka Lumber, as I know, um, Port Carling Community Center and Arena. All the parking on either side of the roadway appears to be out of compliance now on our own community center. So that's what I'm I'm not understanding in this bylaw. Um, so, so help me again, Port Carling Community Center. Okay, okay, so let's take you know. let's take each question independently, if, if we could, because it. Each building is a little different. So where it is already defined that there is an access route under the building code, we are asking for that to be defined as a fire route. So for example, I know the Marina Road, Walkers Point Marina is already an access route. I know that the Port Carling grocery store is already defined as an access route, but I can't find the map. Just trying to find the map exactly to see the parking situation that you're talking about. Okay, so this, this is Bruce Wilson Drive. Page 66 of our agenda package is Foodland. Is that Appendix 16? Does it say Appendix 16? Yes, yeah. that's... Yeah, Appendix 16. So Fire Route Map, Appendix 16. So yes, um, for parking spots that are there already, no, to the, to the mayor, through the chair to the mayor. Uh, no, none of the parking spots would have to be adjusted the way that's defined right now. If you, if you look closely at that map, you'll see the line is actually adjacent to the to the building. And you'd see the other line is adjacent to the building. The, 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 the access route already exists. What we're really doing, and this is actually a good example, you see the top line where we enter in off the roadway, we're defining that area by the hydrant to be clear. Right now, under our current arrangement of parking laws, that is on private property where that fire hydrant exists. There is no law that we can apply to anybody when they park next to that hydrant. Because this, this hydrant exists on private property off a of private roadway. Hmm. So this is to correct a lot of those situations that happen within the township. What we could do is if somebody should park in front of that hydrant, we could go apply the fire code to the owner of the building. And I don't see that as a fair situation for the owner of the building. Yep. Okay, Mayor, you have a puzzled look on your face. Well, I, I guess I got a slightly conflicting view to the Walker's point in particular, because it's driving by spaces. And I guess if, the red line must always be clear that that roadway can always have a vehicle go down it, then I'm okay with this, meaning I can't block the road. Um, but if I can't park adjacent to that line, then I would have a bigger issue. Okay, Chief Morrell. Yes, yeah, so to the mayor's point, we actually had this come up with a different conversation with a, a parking lot recently that was being proposed for a museum. What, what's usually built into the plan for zoning is there is a three foot separation between where the vehicles are 
and where the, um, the building is. So there's already a separation there. There has to be so many access points along that wall face and the fire truck has to be able to access behind those vehicles at all times. So that's why it's kept clear. So you can't just allow somebody to uh, put a bunch of material or park vehicles too deep. Uh, that would be an odd situation anyway, but it, it just prevents that from happening so that the fire apparatus will have access to those walls to be able to uh, fight a fire. So yes, within reason, we wouldn't ask that you take away parking spots if we could park or if we could have a laneway just behind the vehicles themselves. Does that answer your question? Yeah, but I, I took some solace in, in the, the second part of the of the resolution where uh, you know, it's a work in progress, uh, reporting back to the committee on the progress of the initiative. So I think it's a it's an ongoing continuous improvement kind of thing and uh, much needed here. Councillor uh, Mazan and then Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you, and through you, I'd been looking at this as a whole, but as soon as the mayor started talking about Walker's Point Marina, I think I need to recuse myself just because I'm not quite 100% sure if I have a pecuniary interest in this particular case, both of my children work there. So I'm going to go off camera just for this particular topic as it related to parking at that facility. Um, thank you. Good, thank you. Okay, Councillor Roberts and then Councillor Edwards and we'll call the vote. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. I had to get out of the sun here. Um, from the Milford Bay Community Center, Specifically, you know the parking spots there. Are any being lost with us uh, putting uh, uh, passing this uh, bylaw? Uh, through you, Chair, um, no. So what we'll do is we'll endeavor to make sure that the laneway in the middle is kept open at all times. We'll have them place their signage in such a manner that indicates where the laneway should be. Um, Putting paint on the ground, I find to be completely ineffective in a wintry environment where we're plowing the snow all the time. It basically makes them have to constantly be painting the ground. Um, I'd rather it be indicated on a sign three feet from where this position is immediately behind this parked area is a fire lane. It must be kept clear at all times. And we can go and help those parties work with that. Okay, good. Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Windermere Rogue, uh, the Windermere House, uh, on page 76, which is uh, Appendix 26. Uh, I know in previous years they've had no no parking on, on the road, and I think the Windermere House have, have taken them down at, at, at times, and they, they should be on it, because if you look at on that page, right at and that, you'd have to have a fire truck right at the side of that, that and that we should have something in there. I don't know if it's fire route, uh, no no parking, or just a no parking sign. But, um, and that because when they park on that road, you have to swing out and around it on, on a hill and it's dangerous at, at, at the best of times. So, and that, uh, thank you very much. And I will support this. Good, thank you. Duly noted, Chief. Good, thank you. Okay, seeing no other, uh, Hands up, no other questions from the committee. I'm gonna read uh, this motion moved by Councillor Jagluitz, seconded by Councillor Nisikawa. Uh, be it resolved that the draft fire route bylaw attached as appendix uh, one to staff report ES 2022-014 uh, be approved. That would be attached as appendix I, I believe. And that the fire chief report back with a report to committee on the progress of this initiative. All those in favor? Okay, that's carried unanimous. Thank you, Chief, for your time and your attention. Okay, we're at item 8A now on our agenda as it relates to inviting uh, our Economic Development Officer, Corey Moore, uh, with his report on uh, the EV, Electrical Vehicle change, Charging Stations. Go ahead, Corey, welcome. Thank you, Chair Zavitz, and good afternoon, Committee. Uh, today's report provides a, an overview um, of electric vehicle charging uh, stations in the township of Muskoka Lakes. As committee is familiar with, we received a proposal in May regarding the installation of two uh, charging stations at the Portage Landing parking lot in Bala. And at the conclusion of that discussion, uh, committee directed staff 
um, to look at uh, the township's um, current policies and as it regards uh, to locations for electrical vehicles uh, in the township of Muskoka Lakes. Since that time, um, staff have uh, spent some time researching uh, what's completed in uh, other municipalities across the province. We also took some time to meet with uh, a few electric, uh, electrical vehicle uh, charging companies um, to learn a little bit about the technology itself and uh, their processes on how they uh, identify uh, proper locations, etc. Uh, it would seem that uh, there's two different models out there for electrical vehicle, electric vehicle charging stations. Um, you have companies that produce the infrastructure themselves and, and just sell it as a product um, to an owner operator. Um, and there's also companies out there that try to manage the network themselves, identifying uh, specific locations that uh, meet uh, their requirements and uh, they maintain owner operation of the infrastructure itself. From a technology standpoint, uh, this was touched on a bit during that May committee meeting, but uh, there's two levels. Well, there's actually three uh, levels of charging infrastructure, um, but as it pertains to public use, there's typically two, um, two types of chargers that are used, a level two destination charger and a level three uh, rapid charge. And uh, obviously the difference uh, between the two um, is the time it takes to uh, fully charge an electrical vehicle. As it relates to Muskoka Lakes in particular, um, there's currently no level three um, charging stations available to the public. There are uh, level two chargers in place at a few uh, private properties across the township. And as it pertains to the role of municipalities across the province, there seems to be two approaches that, uh, that are common. And those two approaches are the township or the municipality itself taking a lead in the installation of EV uh, infrastructure. And the second seems to be that of the market driving uh, the development of the infrastructure. Um, and the main uh, differences between those that's common across the provinces, typically larger municipalities have taken the approach of uh, leading the develop of development of that infrastructure, whereas it's more common for uh, smaller to medium sized municipalities um, to let the market drive the development of that infrastructure. And a lot of that just relates to the resources required and the time uh, or in the financial requirements associated with those as well too. Um, depending on the location itself, the costs of installation can get fairly high for level three rapid chargers in particular. So looking at the township in particular and our current policies, our current uh, official plan uh, is silent in regards to vehicle charging stations. Although the zoning bylaw does define both the uses of a gas bar and automobile service station. And uh, township staff would interpret to, to permit both the installation and use of electrical vehicle stations at these, um, at these locations. As you're aware, we are updating the official plan right now. And uh, we could uh, certainly uh, include reference to electrical vehicle charging stations for community use uh, in automotive and marine sales and service establishments. Um, and in particular, define um, policies um, where electrical vehicle charging infrastructure, infrastructure for public use uh, is proposed to be located on township property. And in the report, um, a few of those guidelines or standards have been identified uh, in bullet form, and they speak to um, appropriate locations, suitable power, the purpose of the installation, um, parking related issues and agreements with, uh, with the township and the applicants themselves. As it relates to the municipality itself, it would seem that the uh, pr pragmatic approach, um, similar to that of internet in the township um, and in particular broadband tower lease agreements that we see on township property um, would be to let that market-driven approach occur. 
Um, again, due to our current resources and the financial requirements um, required to be um, the lead if we were to take that approach. As such, the resolution or the recommendation in today's report um, is to include those updated policies in the draft official plan. And should committee concur with those, township staff could then review the proposal that we received in May in greater detail um, as it pertains to those policies itself and uh, return for uh, discussion regarding the specific proposal itself at that time. Um, with that chair, I know Director Becking and Director Pink have also been involved with uh, this report and uh, are available for questions uh, as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Great report, very insightful. Uh, I see uh, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Mayor Harding, and then Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, and through you to um, uh, Mr. Moore, uh, I would like to um, have staff um, present their ideas or bring their ideas um, sometime, I guess, during or after the Friday um, public meeting. So that um, I don't know whether I, I'm, I'm stopping out of, of line, but it's, it's timely that we put this in um, for the next draft of the of, of, or, or the the op so uh, uh <clears throat> please uh, come with the wording and that suggested as a maybe if you have to come as a delegate i think uh, that would be great thank you okay david would david want to speak to that in, ter in terms of uh verbiage and inclusion in uh the friday uh the friday meeting uh, thank you uh, through you i believe that the suggested policy is in the staff report and the resolution refers to that language. So should committee uh, pass that resolution today uh, and council ratify it, I will certainly advise the consulting team and that language would be put in the next draft uh, of the official plan. And would that be indic indicated on uh, Friday? I, I can certainly, uh, through you, if uh, committee or council wishes, I can certainly refer to uh, this meeting briefly in my introduction if, if you feel it's uh, needed. I think uh, the agenda certainly is a public report and a public meeting today, um, but I can certainly uh, highlight that if, uh, if we feel necessary. I think that highlight, I'm seeing some uh, nodding of heads. I think that highlight is relevant. So please, uh, please include that in your, your preamble, if you would. Be so kind. Thank you for that. Uh, any other words, David or or Ken Becking? You were referenced by uh, by Corey Moore. Any thoughts you'd like to share, or we're we good with that? We'll just carry on. Nothing further from uh, from my perspective, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mayor Harding, and then uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you very much. Um, for some reason, my computer is not opening the report 2022-15. Uh, for that specific report, but uh, I certainly appreciate where this is going and some policies in within potentially the uh, official plan. Um, I would not want to ignore, and I think maybe at another time regarding our community improvement plans and everything else, if we want to lead, we should be literally putting in level three charging stations, at least one in Bala and one in Port Carling. Yes, it may be a couple hundred thousand dollars, but I think we might want to be considering that for our 2023 budget. Um, to have someone go to a gas station is fine. I'm not sure the gas stations who sell petrol necessarily want to uh, bring people in. I think where we have an opportunity to visit our shops and provide a retail component while a level three charger is happening, the level two chargers uh, that we have, people tend to park their vehicles there for the day or night. Um, they're being provided uh, like at fixtures free of charge. Uh, I really wouldn't want our downtown core being clogged up with a three hour or five hour charge or sorry, a five hour charge of a, a Tesla. So um, I think going forward, looking potentially to me for a 2023 budget, I would be uh, certainly in favor of putting a, aside uh, a plan to put in some level three chargers. Good. Thank you for that comment. OK, Mayor Kelly. <laughs> Peter Kelly, Councillor Kelly, go ahead. Thank you, and through you. Um, I just have a real quick question about uh, the whole issue of uh, charging stations and EVs uh, and official plan policy, and that is whether or not uh, our Fire Chief Morrell has had any input or would have any input uh, into it. One of the issues that 
frankly, it was an article I read last night. Uh, there have been not huge numbers. I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but there has been uh, occasion in the last week or two of uh, several Teslas that uh, spontaneously erupt in flames while charging. And the reality is that they take 4,500 gallons of water to put out. And uh, I think most uh, municipal firefighting services aren't equipped, or at least if they are equipped, uh, you know, you have to have to do, you have to give a lot of thought about where they're going to be and whether we're able to deal with it if it should happen. So my question really is uh, to Chief Morell: is that something that uh, that's ever come across his desk and should he not give some thought to that? Thank you. Chief Morell. Uh, through you, Chair, to the councillor, if the councillor is referring to, there's actually a whole bunch of uh, new documents that have come out and new training about how we're going to suppress fires that relate to these lithium ion batteries and they're what it's called, it's called a runaway uh, condition that happens with the batteries. Um, I, I've taken the training, some of the training myself, we've delivered it to some of our folks so that they're aware that this is a condition that's going to keep happening. You're also going to see these batteries in emergency storage systems near dams and windmills. And uh, so you're going to see more of this condition uh, to the councillor's point. He's done some research. Uh, we need a lot of water. Uh, luck would have it. We're already set up to bring a lot of water to the party because we have uh, 10 tankers in the township. So and we're never more than a kilometer away from water. And we're pretty adept at getting water from most of our waterways. But to the councillor's point, those conditions would have to be uh, considered. There's setbacks that have to be considered whenever these things are designed. And I know that the uh, hydro uh, companies are looking at this. Um, and if council wants, I can send some other research through from uh, uh, the Fire Safety Research Institute. They have a whole training package about how we're supposed to fight these kind of fires. But to the councilor's point, yes, we are considering it. And as we're looking at any developments that occur, we will evaluate that with the new um, documents as they're developed. Okay, good thumbs up there. Okay, councilor Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair, for allowing me to speak twice on this subject. Um, I, um, I, I agree with the Mayor um, for the quick charging, rapid charging in, in uh, Port Carling and, and uh, Bellow, anything we can do. But I also suggest that the budget should uh, consider uh, putting the same um, charging stations in our major, I don't know what we call it, in the, I forget what we call it in the recreation uh, master plan, uh, but in, in our major community centres. Uh, that uh, that same type of um, uh, service should be offered and, and should be costed for budget consideration. Thank you. Good, thank you. And uh, to uh, Corey Murray, you go ahead. Yes, thank you, Chair. And uh, I just wanted to follow up on a few of those comments regarding um, the installation of EV chargers, maybe in multiple communities throughout the township. Um, currently, um, the report in front of you today and the recommendation is to add um, some policies to the draft OP for the use of EV chargers on uh, township property and help us guide proposals we would receive um, from, from the private sector. Um, certainly moving forward, um, should the township wish to um, look at adding uh, EV infrastructure ourselves, uh, we are completing our uh, climate adaptation plan currently, and we will be beginning a mitigation plan uh, in 2023, at which time uh, could be a good opportunity um, to look at uh, those opportunities further. Uh, just yeah. wanted to add those notes, Chair. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Jaglitz. Thank you, Chair. Actually, I just wanted to add a a response to Councillor Kelly's uh, comment about uh, fire, uh, a Tesla being on fire. Um, data supports that for one Tesla car fire, about 50,000 gas and diesel fires occur. So <laughs> let's not worry about it. Thank you. <laughs> Good commentary, I love it. Okay, thank you, uh, committee. I see no other, no, no other hands. And a great discussion. Uh, moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that staff be directed to include EV infrastructure policy con 
contained in staff report CED 2022-21 in the draft official plan, and that until the draft official plan is in effect, the EV infrastructure policy contained in staff report CED-2022-21 be used to review any proposals to locate privately owned EV infrastructure on township property. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you, committee. Thank you, Chief Morrell. Good job. Okay, I'm moving on now to item uh, nine, which is unfinished business committee. Any unfinished business to consider? Seeing none, I'll move to item 10, which is new business, District Municipality of Muskoka updates. Uh, I'll ask, invite the mayor to, to commence. Mayor Hardy. Uh, thank you very much. We had a relatively short meeting. In July, uh, one item of note was our usage at um, our transfer stations across the district uh, through 2019 through 2021. We certainly saw an increase uh, in visits to those properties. In 2022, we've seen a slight decrease, but uh, still very high usage. Um, the data that we're uh, collecting will help us going forward to amend and adjust uh, transfer station schedules to make sure we deliver appropriate services and volumes. Uh, the only other thing that would affect Muskoka uh, or Muskoka Lakes in particular is uh, the owner of SWS Marine had uh, come to committee back in May uh, requesting some uh, variances regarding our lock fees, suggesting that it was about a $40,000 hit to him, the changes in lock fees. Um, we determined that it's actually more in the five to $8,000 change and um, not 40,000 cost. So uh, committee has uh, continued to keep our uh, rates at the locks in place. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Jagwoods. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've once again, very little to report. And in fact, our meeting for this month has been canceled, but there were two quick items. Number one, we looked at the investments at the, uh, uh, district has, and uh, because they have invested about 140 million of it in, in uh, other than uh, government bonds and so on, there was a, a six million dollar reduction in the value for the first six months. Of course, everybody predicts that'll recover. Um, the other item was uh, just a note: they, uh, we approved the insurance package, uh, district approved insurance package at a 13 percent increase. Uh, the two bidders were the same as ours. And you recall, ours was approved with a 45% reduction. So we're, we're doing something right. Thank you, that's my report. Good, thank you, appreciate it. Okay, Councilor Nishikawa, go ahead. Thank you. Um, for health services, um, uh, I hope some of you have seen some of the media releases concerning Fairburn, and we're moving forward with that project. Um, more importantly, for this committee, uh, our uh, ambulance station for Glen Orchard, essentially Port Carling, but on, on 118, um, was discussed at uh, council on Monday, as well as uh, previous committee meetings. Um, and the, the price that was, that the, that staff had um, submitted uh, for the in initial quotes um, was far below uh, what the real quotes had that had come in. So there were um, two particular um, return documents of, of people that wanted to submit quotes for this project. And they were all closer to the 400000 or $400 uh, per square foot. Um, and I re would recommend others look at the district report to have a better understanding of that. But it was interesting because we did have to have a vote of, and this was important because we are in a lame duck situation or will be for district council. Uh, and the reason why this had to come forward so that we would allow staff to do further work on, on this item. I am very, very grateful for um, councillors from other municipalities and their support to move this forward. I understand the amount of money is quite a bit greater, but the risk to our municipality to put this off uh, for a couple of years, and essentially that's what we would be talking about because we couldn't start the process again 
until February of next year. So we that's when we would submit bids again and all of those types of things. Uh, but in this way, we allowed staff, uh, or it was voted on. I just wish we had a better support from our own municipality. That was a disappointment for me. But I will say that um, we are moving forward with this. And it isn't very, very important that in my mind, that the Township of Muskoka Lakes receives the same services that are available to Huntsville, Bracebridge, and Gravenhurst. And it's not just about Muskoka Lakes up as well. It all It's affecting West Muskoka. So in doing this, we are able to do that. And again, I will mention about community medicine and the importance of community medicine, that they can't do that in our township with the, the, the facility that we have now. Um, but again, I really, the importance of community mem mem medicine has been recognized by the province and the district has received large amounts of money and grants to do this. Uh, so the Muskoka Lakes has to be part of that program. Thank you. Good, thank you. Good progress there. Alan Edwards, Councillor Edwards, you go right ahead, sir. Thank you, I'll be very, very brief because it's lunchtime, but um, we had a, a, a report on Canada Early Learning and Child Care uh, Status Update. And with the uh, er, early uh, childhood uh, care, the minimum wage for, for those workers is $18 an hour. And they also have added one uh, position at the uh, district to help manage that. The 10-year housing and homeless plan annual report was given. And uh, the only other thing of interest would be that um, the Villas of Muskoka in the uh, Township of Muskoka Lakes was granted final approval June the 6th, 2022. Thank you very much. That's my report. Okay, thank you. Okay, item uh, 10B. Thank you for those four uh, for providing that information to us on the district's uh, machinations. Item 10B, community events update. Uh, do we have some hands up? People want to tell us what's going on around this township this weekend? Okay, Councillor Edwards and then uh, Councillor Kelly. Actually, it's not this uh, weekend, but uh, the Cherry Fox run is, is going on in Windermere on September the 18th. I believe we've moved it to the Windermere Community Center now so we can have more room for the silent auction. And hopefully this year we will push our uh, totals up over a half a million dollars for Windermere. Thank you. Good. And everyone's welcome. All right, Councillor Kelly. Thank you. Uh, and through you, just one word, Chautauqua is on up in uh, Windermere. Uh, Val and I have gone to two of the documentaries. It's, a, it's just a wonderful experience. And I tell you, this, this has the feel, this thing has the feel of something that's about to break wide open. It's got a real... Uh, terrific draw and uh, yeah, it runs through, I don't know if it's Saturday or Sunday this week, there's music, there's art, there's documentary films, it's all outdoors. I think it's all by donation, but I may be wrong. Uh, most of it is. Um, and uh, I, I swear a couple of years from now, you'll wish you came now while you could still get in. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Bridgman. Just quickly from the library board, uh, the Friends of the Library have their silent auction going on again, uh, now through, uh, I think it's to mid-August. So you can catch the link from the uh, from the website, uh, but please consider having a look and supporting our library. Okay, anyone else? I know that Bell is gonna be rocking this weekend with the Shake the Lake scenario and also there's a pickleball tournament uh in bala at the arena so it's going to be a busy weekend in in bala um okay item 11 uh which is general information correspondence of course there's a link now you'll see that we've changed the format that we're doing and now you can uh, find a link that takes you to a landing page where there's some um 10 10 items. Any commentary from anyone on those items as indicated um, on that landing page on our website? Okay, seeing none, thank you for that. Uh, we don't have any closed sessions, so we're looking at adjournment. It's one o'clock. I would read this. Um,
You're on mute, Glenn. Glenn, you're on mute. So I started that way, I'll end that way. <laughs> Be it resolved that this uh, meeting adjourned at 1 p.m. Um, and the next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on Wednesday, September 14th, 2022 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair electronically from the Council Chambers Municipal Office in Port Carling, Ontario. All those in favor? Great, so an announcement, we'll see you all back here at two o'clock for Council. Thank you. <laughs>